live. Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Griffin Spalding County School Board uh, virtual board meeting, um, six o'clock on the 21st of, of July. And I believe we do have all board members that are present. And um, so I want to call it to order. And thank you for those that are joining us virtually via YouTube uh, for being with us also. Um, those that are on the uh, call itself, if you will, make sure that you stay muted, um, except for when uh, you need to talk. That way we don't get the background noise uh, and those type of things. Um, you know, I don't actually... Oh, here it is. Yeah. Um, so at this time, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Mr. Brown for our school spotlight. Good evening, Mr. Chair, colleagues, and Mr. Superintendent. Today, we are excited to highlight our one of our amazing schools that are doing great things socially and academically. It gives me great pleasure to present the Griffin, to present the Griffin Spalding Board of Education Spotlight. I also would like to thank my colleagues for their support in this endeavor as we continue to build morale and highlight the amazing things that our schools are doing socially and educationally. Today, the Griffin Spalding Board of Education awards our July 2020 Spotlight to Atkinson Elementary School. Let's clap it up for Atkinson. Atkinson is definitely indeed a special place. Uh, my constituent, Mr. Frank Touchstone, served as principal of Atkinson. And whenever I see him, Mr. Frank Touchstone always says to me, how is Atkinson doing? Are you looking out for Atkinson? So I would like to, on behalf of Mr. Frank Touchstone, let everybody know that I am indeed looking out for Atkinson because it is a distinguished District 1 school. And uh, Mr. Smith, sent over some information as it relates to Atkinson Elementary and the statement that our principal uh, made in regards to receiving the school spotlight. Uh, how many scholars attend your school? There are 429 scholars enrolled at Atkinson. What is your school mascot? We are the Bears. How many faculty and staff members work at your school? We have 60 team members on staff at Atkinson Elementary. And number four is a quote from the principal on why you love being the proud principal of the school. Um, Ms. Campbell said, Mrs. Campbell said, I love being the proud principal at Atkinson Elementary School because I get to be a part of progress and change. What makes me so proud is witnessing the accomplishments of my scholars and team. I do not take sole credit for the achievements taking place at Atkinson. The work that we do is only possible when we all recognize the mission and vision and work together to see it through. That is so true. Number five, what are the good things going on at Atkinson socially and academically? Atkinson has increased its CCRPI score by 17 points over the last five years. Great job. Demonstrated academic gains and progress on the Georgia milestones. Participated in our first ever walk to school event, which was really cool. I was there for that. Welcome GSCS mentors um, to mentor approximately 10 of our most deserving scholars. I do know that Mayor Holberg has been very instrumental in the mentor program. Um, I I can't remember, Kadavi, I think is the guy, is the young scholar's name. I remember going and sitting and talking with them and we're doing, he was showing them how to do different knots. And uh, Kadavi was able to show me 10 different knots that Mayor Holberg has showed him through their time together of mentoring. So that program is definitely a success. Participated in the Read with Malcolm event, which supplied 90 of our second grade students with a copy of the book, Read with Malcolm. Participated in the Read to Final Four event, for third grade scholars making it to the round round of 64. And I also know that um, there are several teachers there that do amazing things within their classrooms. Uh, Ms. Amanda Woods is one of them who, um, if any you know, central office staff or board members are interested in making sure that children have a purchase book to take home with them or have a purchase book in their possession, then you should reach out to Ms. Campbell um, and Ms. Woods who are able to 
uh, put you in contact so that you can sponsor for a child to have a book. We know that great things happen when children, scholars, and parents and families begin to read. Our team members have also continued to grow professionally, adding six new endorsements, six new endorsements in the areas of multi-tier support systems, coaching and gifted education, leading professional learning in our building, and during the February Professional Learning Day. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, I would like to present the July 2020 GSCS School Spotlight to Atkinson Elementary. Congratulations. Absolutely. And we have with us uh, on the line, Mr. Caden Smith. Mr. Caden Smith is a fifth grader uh, at Atkinson. And he, after Mr. Holmes does our opening prayer, he will be leading us in our pledge this evening. So we thank you for that. Mr. Holmes. Let us bow our heads. Father God in heaven, the great creator and our benefactor. We thank you, Lord God, for another day that you've allowed us to see. We pray, Lord God, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're asking right now, Lord God, that you cover us with your grace, your mercy, and your favor. And we ask these things because we know you're able. We're asking right now, Lord God, let us make good decision on behalf of all of our constituents, our staff, and all the students concerned. And we ask, Father God, that you watch over not only the board members, but watch over uh, our staff and watch over everyone that makes up what is known as the Griffin Spalding County school system. And Father God, most of all, bring peace not only to our city, to our state, to our country, but also to our nation. And Father God, let us all humble ourselves and turn back to you as we solicit, solicit you to heal the land. It's in Jesus' name we do pray and give all thanks. Let every heart say amen. Amen. All right. Um, Mr. Smith, if you would then unmute yourself and uh, lead us in our, in our pledge. You're still muted. There you go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic of which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so very much. We appreciate you being willing to come online and do that. Um, Hopefully, uh, in the near future, we'll be able to see you sometime in person and shake your hand for it. So we appreciate that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to turn it back over to Mr. Brown for our school system announcements. Hey, Mr. Chair, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I woke up and got this message from um, our scholar clerk who said that she was not feeling well. Um, she did say, but Mr. Brown is not COVID related. It's, since my voice isn't the best, um, I thought it would have been proved by now. So she, uh, her mom took her to the doctor. And so um, you're stuck with me doing your uh, GSCS announcements. But before we do that, Mr. Chair, if I could ask for a point of personal privilege. Um, over the weekend, we lost two giants um, in the civil rights movement and just in American history. Uh, Congressman John Lewis, who is known as a freedom rider, um, civil rights um, icon, and Georgia congressman representing the 5th Congressional District, and the Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian. And just a little fact that I wanna um, let you know that uh, John Lewis became the a member and later chairman of the Student Nonviolent non Coordinated Committee, also known as SNCC. Um, SNCC was a way that the younger uh, people would get involved doing the civil rights movement and so as they traveled to different cities and i know that one of the most successful marches that happened with snick and dr king was down in albany georgia and so just wanted to make that known and as john lewis congressman lewis as a freedom writer uh, was a student at fisk university um, he also 
Uh, many times you hear of his great speeches that were done um, during the, the March on Washington. And so also as we talk about uh, the, the, the powerful and the American myth of the Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian. Um, he was a close friend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and a good friend of Joseph Lowry. And so we are just thankful for the opportunity that God allowed these two giants of icons and, and American, uh, great American folks to uh, grace our earth and, and leave behind a great legacy. And so um, thank you for that moment. And I'll go ahead with our announcements now. Uh, congratulations to Atkinson Elementary for being our July 2020 school spotlight. Also Tuesday, July 28th, we will have a called virtual board meeting at 5 p.m. Be on the lookout on the school website and social media for the link to those meetings. Tuesday, August 4th will also be a board of education meeting at 6 p.m. Um, Tuesday, August 18th, 2020, Board of Education Work Session. Uh, just in, in, uh, encouraging everybody to please log on to participate in your call board meetings, the regular board meetings and work sessions. And tentatively right now, it's looking at Tuesday, September 8th will be the first day of school. That concludes my report, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, respectfully, I, I forgot to mentioned a very important piece of information about uh, one of our principal, Dr. Brody, over at Moore Elementary. She's experienced her death. Uh, she lost her husband unexpectedly, and uh, I, 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 I was intended to uh, include them in our prayers uh, as I prayed at the beginning, but I want to uh, just, just make note of that so each and every one can keep Dr. Brody lifted up in prayer. Thank you very much for mentioning that. And yes, we definitely want to do that as a, during this time of loss. Uh, okay, board members, uh, we're at the point then of uh, the adoption of our agenda. I would entertain that motion. So Mr. Chair, I would like to make a motion to accept the adoption of the agenda. Okay, I have a motion and then Ms. Barbara Joe has seconded. Um, any discussion? Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chair, I do like to say thank you to Mr. Smith and cabinet members and staff members that I spoke with today. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Um, I do want to give a shout out, which I failed to do this morning when I was speaking to Ms. Sarah Jones. Uh, Ms. Jones, I got several compliments from teachers that were on the committee about how you make them feel so welcome and you make their input feel welcome during the task force. And so I just want to say to you, Ms. Jones, thank you so much. Uh, for all that you do for our school district, everything you do for our system. We know that instructional services is uh, one of your babies and it is why we are successful in our school district with uh, testing and everything else that's going on. And so from myself and to other constituents in the first district, I wanna say thank you for fostering an atmosphere for that committee where everyone was able to provide their input and then it was also taken into consideration and I shared with that with Mr. Akins today, but I just want to say to you, Ms. Jones, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mr. Brown. Thank you very much. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by raising your right your hand so we can see it. Okay. I think that we have everybody. 5-0. Uh, it is now time for public comments. And I know that we have two people that are have signed up in the room. Uh, and if you would, um, Mr. Lonnie, if you would continue to highlight those as they come. Uh, if you would, when I call your name, if you would unmute and share your name and your and your address, and then uh, share with us um, what you would like to share in your public comments. Just know that the board members are listening, we're hearing, we're taking down information. Uh, we will not be responding back to you this evening, but. Uh, we are so grateful for you being taking the time to come and to speak to us. So is Ms. Carol Cobb ready? Yes, I am. Good evening, everybody. Um, board members, I sent you a letter a few days ago with my thoughts and opinions on these issues about school reopening. And I signed up for public comment because I had some additional clarifications and thoughts to add to it. One second. Okay, sorry. 
joys of mom life. Um, I forgot to add, I'm a teacher at Orr's Elementary, and my daughter attends Orr's too, and we live here in Griffin, 160K Road. Um, okay, so I sent a letter with my thoughts on this issue, but I had some clarifications to make and just additional things after conversation with other community members about it. And in my letter, I shared that I think as a teacher and a parent, it would be best to go with all virtual learning so we can make more long-term plans and everybody can get trained in how to teach virtually. And by doing that, have a blend of synchronous and asynchronous approaches to it so that parents have flexibility on what time of the day they're working with their children on the work instead of it being just set hours. Um, I wanted to add on to that, that a lot of people were concerned about what to do about support staff. Some, some ideas that I had was nutrition and bus drivers. I think instead of having the meals at those five schools within the community, we could keep them employed and helping out in a huge way by having them deliver meals along those bus routes. Because I had students in my class that couldn't get to the schools because their parents were working during those hours but if it would have been delivered to their homes where they had like grandparents or whoever that couldn't go pick it up it would help them um, i did see in the faqs that we're doing hot spots or wi-fi on some buses and like areas so that was good that was an idea i was going to suggest too though and I did say for pair pros that it would be awesome if they were still helping teachers prep physical materials. And, you know, those could be delivered along those bus routes too, weekly or biweekly, however often. And then we're still putting books in the hands of kids that are doing virtual learning and it's getting brought right to them. That'd be awesome. Um, I also wanted to suggest that while we're doing virtual learning or even if we go back in person, we need to have really clear protocols and a data management solution for tracking confirmed cases among staff and scholars so that we have that data at our fingertip, fingertips and we can see trends in it. I think that's going to be really essential data this year. We're already a very data-driven school system, but we're going to need to know where cases are happening and which schools are having more. And my husband's a data scientist, and that's kind of his big thing about it. Um, all right, one last thing I wanted to point out is I feel like we need to go hurry up and have really clear directions out there for both parents and staff on what do we do if we're exposed to someone that is suspected of having COVID or has a confirmed case already. We know test results are taking some time to come back. So what do you do if someone is having symptoms, but you don't know that they've tested positive yet? I mean, I would hate for someone to come and expose people in the school just because there's not a positive test result yet. So that's definitely a big issue we need to look at having clear instructions about. All right, so thank you for hearing my ideas. Again, I'm thinking all virtual learning would be the safest option for now, and it would allow us to go ahead and start planning. And I think there's a lot of people that do want to go ahead and come back in person. And I feel like instead of having teachers sign up to be virtual teachers, maybe have teachers sign up for, hey, I'm willing to go in person. And once we have everything down for how to do that safely, start opening up space for those classes. So, and thank you for your time and everything you're doing to make these difficult decisions. Thank you, Ms. Cobb. Thank you, Ms. Cobb. We appreciate you coming and sharing with us and uh, definitely taking that information. Um, Mr. I, I Chair. If I could ask that you do not require uh, people doing public comments to state their address during the virtual meeting. Um, I think we were able to capture that Google form, but just for safety that we not mention their addresses. I agree. I am okay with that. Are the board members all right? Yes. I'm fine with it. All right. Um, I failed to mention at the beginning of that, that we, uh, basically the way this works is we designated, uh, uh, five minutes to the one topic and then one minute for each person thereafter. Um, we're going to do our best to allow, give everybody the opportunity to share though. So I will just give you a little warning if we're getting close to that time frame, but we want you to be able to share as many thoughts as you possibly can. Uh, next that I have that I know is is in the room is um, Miss Ebony Kampalian. Is that how you say that? Kampalian? 
Uh, you almost had it, Conklin. <laughs> almost. Yeah, All right. <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much, uh, Chair Doss for Chairman Doss for allowing me to speak this evening. I, I emailed the uh, school board for my concerns as well. Um, my concern was to go virtual as well, but go back with the traditional uh, school calendar, which we would start start in August. Um, the reason why I feel that um, we could start in August and go virtual would to give the uh, school board opportunity to review every 30 days uh, regarding the COVID-19 to see if that's something we can reopen up the school um, based off if COVID-19 subsides here in Georgia. Um, so if we were to do virtual um, and start on the traditional uh, school calendar, uh, that will allow for uh, teachers uh, and students to remain safe. Um, and it also helps the uh, parents who are teachers, as well as the parents who have to find that, that health care um, based off of the new start date, which is September 8th, that would throw people's routines off. Um, so I would ask for the school board to readdress um, September 8th start date and go with the traditional calendar. Um, if possible. That's all I have. Thank you, Ebony. Thank right, you thank so you. very much for being with us and sharing your thoughts and your ideas and for the email uh, you. that you had sent to us. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Harper, Miss um, Joni, do we have, I don't see anyone else highlighted. Do we have anyone else in the queue? We don't see anyone else in the meeting that has signed up. Uh, to speak to the board. There's a couple of phone numbers uh, listed in here, but when we search those phone numbers, they weren't phone numbers, they used to register. So, uh, we don't see anybody else that signed up. Okay. Um, I do want to say, take the time to say thank you to all. I know every board member and different ones have received many emails, many texts um, from concerned parents, concerned teachers, and different ones. And so uh, we. <coughs> Try to take every one of those, and uh, we'll just mention that if if we miss one or one slip through the cracks on us, I know Miss Sue was concerned earlier today that she. I hope I didn't miss anybody on uh, replying, but it is important that you have a voice uh, to be able to share your thoughts and uh, opinions, and we take those things very serious uh, and continue to pass that information along to the central office so that uh, we are working from both directions. So uh, we appreciate that. Um, as long as there is no one else that has entered the room, as far as public comments, we will then move on to our consent agenda. Uh, and so board members, I would entertain a motion, um, for our consent agenda items. So move, so move Mr. Chair. Yeah, I have a motion by Mr. Brown and a second. Was that Miss Sue? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by raising your hand. All right, and I am not seeing um, Mr. Holm. Okay, I, I see him. I, thank you, sir. I see you now. I just bring the screen down, Mr. Holm, so we can see your head and your face. I was missing you for just a second. I would like to say that um, one of the things that we just in that consent agenda item was uh, approving the uh, retirement of uh, Mr. Smith, and we have a lot more time later on. And, meetings because he still has a whole lot more work that he's going to do before he is able to retire. But I wanted to let the general public know that next week's uh, five o'clock virtual meeting uh, is with the Georgia School Boards Association. Uh, we will making a, be making a decision at that point in time to uh, whether or not we will enter into agreement with them to do a national uh, superintendent search. On that five o'clock next week, they will be uh, kind of outlining the process, sharing what that timeline would look like. Um, I will say that this, you know, Mr. Smith's retirement did not catch us off guard. We were aware that he was uh, thinking and considering uh, these things. Uh, some of the circumstances and things may have uh, moved it up a bit, but uh, we totally understand that and uh, are looking forward to um, the next few months that he's going to be leading us in that process. So. Um, 
Mr. Chair, also, if you would, um, can you speak to, um, I, you know, although Mr. Smith did send out, or maybe Mr. Smith can speak to it, he did send out communication to GAE members that we are accepting their dues. So if he could just speak to that, uh, to, I know he's already sent out a statement, but for everybody else that's online, that's listening, um, so that they'll know that dues are currently still being accepted for the school district. Uh, yes, sir. We did uh, send a note uh, directly to all of the GAE members in our district that um, that we are continuing to, to, to collect those dues and remember the um, uninterrupted so um, that they can, and we're just gonna do that for the foreseeable future. All right, thank you for that. We will then move into our action items. Um, we had our, at 4.30, some of you may have joined already and we had our, um, for, or the workshop on our fiscal year 21 budget. Uh, that has been delayed because of what has been, you know, the process at the state level, not knowing what those exact numbers are. Uh, and so after having that, we are uh, looking to put that on first reading. So, Mr. Jones, do you have any additional information you need to share with us? Mr. Chair, um, I'm confused. With our consent agenda, you didn't ask for any discussion. Um, that is because it won't, there's no discussion to be done with the consent agenda once we move into that. That's the idea. But once you take the vote, you don't ask for discussion? Not on the consent agenda. Okay. All right. Mr. Jones? Uh, I just, can you hear me? I can. Okay. Yeah, just a formality. Uh, we want to place the budget on first reading. Um, the action memo here through the superintendent recommend, recommendation will call for two public hearings. One would be on Tuesday, August 4th at 5.30 p.m. prior to the 6 o'clock uh, board meeting. And then another public hearing on Tuesday, August the 18th at 4 o'clock uh, prior to the 4.30 p.m. Uh, board meeting. And I just wanted to make a couple of comments for people that may not have been on the work session. We had uh, uh, the board was uh, able to go ahead and, and verbally grant uh, approval for step increases for employees, and, and I want to thank you a lot for that. I know that the teachers and, and all employees will be very happy to hear that. And just a few highlights on the budget. You know, we're planning on keeping the millage rate consistent. And as I talked to you, uh, or Ryan did in the uh, budget presentation, uh, we've been able to keep the uh, uh, ending fund balance above the state. Uh, best practice amount, uh, even with all of the, the things that have happened with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So uh, even though the budget has been delayed, I want to uh, be complimentary also of Mr. Smith and Ryan before I came on board. They didn't choose to rush the budget through for approval. And there was a lot of thought processes that went into this to make sure that we got it right. So again, I'm just giving you a high level uh, thank you for letting me to be a part of it. And again, thank you for Ryan for being on that call earlier to handle most of the, the verbiage for that. So uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Smith, but his recommendation is to do what I just said, and we would hope you all vote to do that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jones. And I we do appreciate the chance to present the budget earlier tonight. It um, is a balanced budget in, in, in the terms that we are using um, some of our funds to balance off the expenditures. We're also using the federal CARES money. So we are plugging about a six to six and a half million dollar hole that was left by, um, by the state when they um, did their budget cuts of about 10% to our QB formula. But the budget does not include any layoffs or furloughs. It does include the step increases for employees. It uh, basically continues all the programs we've had, a few additions in terms of some social emotional um, supports with some, uh, mental health clinicians and counselors as well as some technology help uh, so i'm real pleased that our, our budget is um, uh, the financial strength we have in our school district allows us to move a budget forward that is very consistent with the prior year not a whole lot new added but uh, there were no um, cuts that are going to hurt uh, hurt staff or we believe will hurt the program either so i appreciate your consideration of that placing it on first reading tonight is the uh, first step in consideration process and then we'll go forward with work sessions and public hearings etc until we get to a final adoption which we would 
like the target to be that August 18 uh, work session and put it on there for the final adoption. All right, thank you very much. Uh, board members, any questions um, on Mr. Jones or Mr. Smith before I entertain a motion to put it on first reading? Okay, hearing none, I would then entertain a motion. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. Motion by Ms. Barbara Joe, and the second was that Mr. Zach? Yes, sir. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by raising your hand. Okay, looks like it was 5 0. All right, Mr. Jones, I'll turn it back over to you and Mr. Smith again for the continuing spending resolution. Okay, Mr. Chairman, thank you. This is a uh, uh, kind of a do over for what we did in July. We went ahead and cautioned you that we may need to do another spending resolution for the month of August, um, which basically puts us in compliance with state law. Uh, most of the surrounding districts are doing this as well, which basically gives that you would be granting us the authority to spend one twelfth, or at this point, two twelfths, if you go through the month of August uh, of our budget. And uh, if we pass that uh, adopted budget on August the 18th, then we would not have a need to do another one in September. So. Uh, that would be the recommendation that you all approve that. And uh, uh, this should be the last time we have to do this. Okay, board members, any questions, comments? No, sir. All right, I would entertain a motion then for the uh, uh, recommendation for continuing the spending resolution. So moved. Second. I have a second by Miss, I mean, a motion by Miss Sue, and I believe that was Mr. Centel. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All in favor then to signify by raising your hand. Okay. I believe that was 5 0. Uh, we will then move on to our human resources budget request for fiscal year 21, the Georgia Residency for Education Amazing Teachers. Miss Stephanie Dobbins, can you? address that yes sir thank you board members I, i'm pleased to um, request approval of the georgia residency for educating amazing teachers program in our school system the southern regional education board and the georgia college and state university have been awarded a federal teacher quality partnership grant that allows them to prepare middle grade stem teachers STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math, and we are requesting permission to hire three of these teachers in our school system. The grant through Georgia College would pay the teacher's salary, and the school system would only have to fund the cost of benefits. Um, you can see on the um, agenda that is included in your um, link to the meeting, that uh, basically the cost for benefits for three teachers would be $65,280 a year. In exchange for participation in the program, the teachers sign an agreement to work in our school system for a minimum of three years um, after completion of their, basically their year long uh, student teaching program. They work in a classroom with another teacher the entire school year. So we feel this would be um, a relatively low cost and a great benefit to our school system. So the superintendent recommends funding the benefits costs for these three teaching positions and the salaries be paid through the Georgia um, College Great Program Grant. Okay, board members, any questions? Um, not a question, just more of a statement. I really want to thank uh, Ms. Dobbins for her innovative practices and everything that her team is doing to uh, ensure that we find highly qualified staff members. And so as I shared with her today, um, thank you so much to you and your team for everything that you're doing to ensure that we have highly qualified staff members that are in front of our scholars every day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. All right. If there's nothing else, then I would entertain a motion then to accept this recommendation for the uh, Georgia Residency for Education Amazing Teachers. So moved, Mr. Chair. I have a motion. Second, Mr. Chair. And I have a second. Any discussion? All in favor, then raise your hand. All right. Be 5-0. 
And we'll stay with you, Ms. Stephanie Dobbins, on our human resource budget request for the Elevate K-12 Spanish position for Griffin High School. Uh, thank you, Mr. Doss. Um, the request for Elevate K-12 Spanish position for Griffin High School is another example of an innovative way to um, meet a staffing need. We have um, attempted to hire a Spanish teacher for Griffin High School through traditional channels basically um, the entire spring. And um, we tried to go through Intelage, a uh, company y'all are familiar with us working with for to place foreign teachers. And we have not been able to, to staff that position. Uh, Elevate K-12 is a, an option that would allow us to employ a, through the, this company, a teacher that would um, teach in real time, but she or he would be virtual. We would employ a paraprofessional to manage the classroom and the software program that Elevate K-12 uses allows the teacher and the students to see each other. They provide these materials for the classroom. They can interact. The teacher can see their computer screens. She can see if they raise their hand, they can raise their hand virtually or on the computer screen. We did go out and observe um, this program in other school systems, and we are aware that it's being used um, nationally. So our recommendation is to go with this strategy to cover the need for the Spanish position at Griffin High School, and the cost would be for, for the teacher and the parapro, including benefits, approximately 92000 for the entire school year for Griffin High School. So the, the superintendent recommends allocating that and approving that for Griffin High School this school year. All right. Board members, any questions? Yeah, I, I, I want, want, want to ask Ms. Dobbins, was there a uh, preset, uh, you know, salary line budget, you know, before, you know, before we decided to go this route since we were having a hard time or, did yes, sir. Make, make any adjustments or anything to try to, uh, you know, uh, track someone? Um, this is an allocated position, so um, it, we could verify with Mr. Jones, or, or I'm not sure if Ryan McLemore is on this call or not, but I, I would assume that at least 65000 which is the typical average cost of a teacher, uh, was budgeted. Um, to cover that position. So this might be a little bit above what we would have expected, uh, but it is an allotment that was in the budget to begin with. Yeah, that, that would be accurate. And you know, when we're budgeting, we're using an average salary. So you, there's a little give and take on that every year. So this 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 should be fine. Um, and Ryan did those allotments earlier. I know those positions are already accrued into the end of the budget. So, so you're saying, Mr. Jones, it, it was Ryan and not you that approved it? <laughs> Absolutely. I just want to make sure I got my notes right. <laughs> if, it's a, if, it's a, if it's a good thing, well, I, I'll approve this. This is a good thing. Okay. Mr. Dobbins, I have a question. Um, will we continue to leave this? Uh, are we contracting for the entire year? And do we? is there a way of stopping that after a semester if we continue to advertise and had someone that could then come in uh, mid-semester or mid-year? Mid uh, well, the proposal was to staff it with this teacher for the entire year. I would have to check further into, I believe they would do it by semester if we wanted to do that. We would want to leave the same teacher working with the students for the duration of the semester, um, but we may be able to get a revised contract if we wanted to um, start with someone new for second semester. Okay. So, I, I mean, I was just curious as to, because I, I would think our goal would be for sure if we can to have a, a live person there. Well, certainly I agree that was the goal and we um, did work um, diligently on that. Um, I know that Dr. Warren uh, help, helped Griffin High School and tried to make that happen. Um, and I know that um, Dr. Kellogg tried to fill that since he came on board and he, I know he tried to interview staff members. 
we had an interlock person selected and then they ended up going with a different school system. So we just were not able to, um, to fill that need for this year. Okay. Any additional questions, board members, or Mr. Smith, you have something? Chair, if I could, if I could just uh, add in here, this is a this is a company and a process or an option that you're seeing a lot of districts across the country go to, particularly for hard to fill positions. It, typically, you think about some of the upper level math or upper level science, but you do it in the foreign language as well, and so this is something that. Um, several districts in Georgia have also taken on. We feel like this is kind of our test of this, this particular option to see how well it works for us. And, um, and we'll kind of be able to make a value judgment on whether it's the kind of thing we'd like to do in the future if the need arises. We certainly would much rather be able to hire somebody a full-time owner of the staff, but this does provide an option for those hard to fill positions. And this has definitely been one of those. Okay. Um... Board members, if there's no other questions, I would entertain a motion uh, for this recommendation. So moved. I have a motion by Sue. Second. I have a second by Ms. Barbara Joe. <clears throat> Any discussion? All in favor signify by raising your hand. All right, 5-0. All right, we will move on to our presentations and discussion items. Did I hear something? Now, Mr. Chair, let me just start this before Dr. Kennedy comes in, and and I want to thank the board and uh, for the work that you've been doing and in, in trying to sort through all of these issues. And I we do appreciate the comments we've been getting from staff and parents and the public in general. Uh, this this whole idea of how you stop school and how you start school is a very complex um, issue, and there probably no real right answer out there. It's just probably a matter of trying to do the best you can. And every district is just facing this and across the nation too. And there are a lot of things uh, out there. Uh, we also want to tell you how much I appreciate the work that we've had from our local health officials and kind of help guide us in this process, give us their, their advice. And District 4 of Health, uh, from Department of Public Health, District 4 of LaGrange, they've also been very valuable in this as well. So um, when the board uh, on uh, July the 8th adopted basically the option one, which was the choice between returning to face-to-face -face or an online option and move the date to September 8th, we had to begin the work of um, looking at what a change in date from August to September meant for us. And that's taken up the last you know 10 or 11 days trying to work out all of those implications. So. I'm going to ask Dr. Kennedy to get started on this and, and walk you through what we've uh, learned about that and, and how we uh, would propose to make the September 8 uh, start um, a reality. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, good evening, Mr. Smith and members of the board. Uh, tonight we would like to provide some information regarding what work has been accomplished as part of the reopening of schools plan for option one that was approved on July 8th at the board meeting with a delayed start date of September 8th that was selected by the board. Option one, just to review, provides a normal resumption of in-school operations while implementing a remote at home learning option for parents to sign up for if they are uncomfortable sending their child to school for the first nine weeks. Parents had the option to choose full remote learning for their child or children for the nine week period. The GSCS reopening schools plan that supports option one was shared at the July 8th board meeting and included plans for in-person instruction and remote learning to include specifics around regular education students, special education students, gifted, English as a second language students, pre-K, and a host of other details, including, including social, emotional learning, PBIS, and mental health supports. There are details around maintaining a healthy environment related to safety and health protocols, where we use the guidance from the Georgia Public Health Department, Center of Disease Control, 
the Georgia Department of Education and discussions with our local public health, including uh, District 4 Health Department. Today, we would like to provide an update to the progress for preparing for implementation of option one. Uh, before we get started, I would like to introduce three additional members to the Starter School Task Force. Haley Witcher, an elementary parent, Jamie Widener, a middle school parent, and Akaya Piercy, a high school student, who joined our work on uh, July 14th. I would like for us to go ahead and take a look at remote at home learning information that has been gathered. Uh, one of the things that happened immediately after the July 8th meeting is that we launched some enrollment for the remote at home learning and that launched from July 9th and closed on Friday, July 17th. This information has been collected and shared with schools. Uh, with each principal. Principals will be able to use this data by grade level to balance out class numbers and determine impact on spacing availability in each class to allow for social distancing within classroom settings. Uh, Joni, if you could pull up the enrollment numbers document. Thank you. Here you will find the numbers of enrollment uh, that we have had to sign up for remote at home learning. Um, these numbers from here, we have a total across the district of 4,224 students who are presently signed up for remote at home learning. This uh, 4,224 students makes up about 43% of our student population. Here you can see the numbers by each school. We also have district numbers by grade level as well. Here you see at the elementary grade band, we have 1,912 students signed up, which is 41% of our elementary student population. For our middle school, 1,086 students signed up, which is about 47% of our middle school population. And for our high school students, we have 1,218 students signed up for remote learning, which is approximately 42% of our current students enrolled for the 2020 school year at the high school level. We also have eight students signed up for our main state program. On the second page, you can see the numbers broken down here by grade level across each uh, grade level across the district. So this is K-12 by grade level. And you can see those numbers there from kindergarten through 12th grade as to uh, how many students, which is about close to uh, all of them are about 300 um, or more, except for 12th grade has the two, uh, 12th and 11th grade are uh, over 200. 11th grade is 295, and you see their 12th grade is 275 district-wide. Uh, these numbers have been um, shared with our Human Resources Division and with uh, Byron Jones uh, so that they can start the process of staffing 
uh, because it, it was important to get these numbers to see what they looked like so that uh, we can move into the staffing planning of on-campus teachers and teachers who will be remote learning teachers. Also in the uh, enrollment, we did collect information regarding um, the number of individuals who would have reliable internet of those signed up that 4,224, 98.3% indicated that they have reliable internet services. We had 57 parents or guardians request hotspots for students out of the 4,224. Any questions around those numbers uh, for the uh, remote learning? Did you say 57 parents on hotspots? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Any other questions, board members? Okay, you can continue. Um, the task force met on Tuesday, July 14th to start working on the FAQ the, for questions and responses. Uh, as Mr. Smith has indicated, we know the board received a lot of questions. We received a lot of questions after the, the July 8th meeting. Um, and so we want to make sure that all of those questions were answered. Uh, the communications, we did finalize our first round of responses uh, to the questions and those were shared uh, out to the board yesterday, as well as to uh, the community and to our staff members uh, today. The next task force meeting uh, will be held on July 27th, which will be this coming Monday, the next Monday coming, uh, to discuss work group information that will be uh, brought forth to the task force to include remote learning plans, our COVID student response protocol, which you will hear some about this evening, staffing, uh, we will be looking at where those staffing numbers are, and you'll hear some about the plans for staffing uh, this evening as well. And we'll also be uh, looking at any other FAQ questions that we may receive between now and Monday the 27th to start uh, formulating uh, responses for those. So at this time, we do have some other individuals who are uh, on the meeting um, this evening. We're going to bring some updates. I'm sorry, someone asking a question. Okay. So it's going to bring some updates. We're going to start off with Anthony Akins, uh, who will provide an update on our COVID student response protocol and safety. And while Anthony is uh, providing that update, we will uh, ask uh, Mr. Wheeler to come back and answer the nutrition question that Mr. Brown uh, spoke about in the earlier meeting um, in, ref in reference to the waivers. Uh, following Anthony, we will have Stephanie Dobbins, who will provide an update on the staffing plans. And then we will have Sarah Jones, who will provide an update on the school calendar. There are some implications to the pre-K, um, to our pre-K program around the school calendar. So that would be a great time for Dr. Sauce to come back in and speak to the questions or any questions that Mr. Brown uh, had from earlier around pre-K. If everyone's okay with that, we will move forward with uh, Mr. Akins. Sounds good. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Uh, good evening, board. I uh, wanted to share a couple of things with you. I do have a link to the student isolation protocols we have uh, developed at elementary and the middle level. Um, before I get to that, though, I'd like to quickly address uh, while that's being pulled up um, just some current inventory uh, of our PPE and our uh, cleaning. Um, we have been working hard to try to get uh, all of this equipment and also everything in. We currently have on hand for our sanitation uh, as far as supplies for the cleanings the, and the disinfectants. Uh, we have more than enough to get us through the first semester and then we have our normal orders coming in. So we should be able to get through uh, the first semester through the end of the calendar year. To give you an idea on some of the PPE that we're talking about, uh, disposable masks that we will use for visitors, 
Uh, we currently have about 3,700 of those on hand that will be distributed to the schools um, in order for any visitors that come in to make sure that we have those. As far as our cloth masks and everything uh, that we will have for staff and students, uh, we currently have about 45,000 of those masks on hand. We are expecting another 8,000 to be delivered uh, within the next day or two, and then another 14,000 uh, that we're waiting on confirmation to get in. So we have those. Uh, Mr. Brown, you mentioned last time about face shields and can we supply those? Uh, we, we have been working on that uh, even prior to uh, your question and we're still getting some more in. We currently have a, uh, 800 of those on hand, but we are uh, working to get uh, more of those. And I have reached out to principals and they are checking with their staff as to uh, which ones of, the, of them uh, desire to have one of these and we'll make sure that we uh, get those to them. So uh, we're working and I, on- Mr. Aiken, and yeah. I can let you know now that um, I've been speaking with um, a company that uh, can get the shields for $3.50. So what I'm gonna do is donate about 200 of those shields to the school district um, just as a gift to say, you know, that we want everybody safe. And so um, District 1 and Arsentel Brown will be donating 200 face shields to Griffiths Walden County Schools. Uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Um, I, I would, um, if, if we could speak afterwards, um, we actually have a price a little bit cheaper if you wanted to um, look at that or if you are working with a particular company. So just to, to speak a little more about that afterwards, yes, if you'd like. Um, as far as gloves, we have an assortment of gloves, the vinyl gloves in all sizes, the uh, nitrile gloves. Uh, when we put all of those together, we have on hand about 99,000 uh, gloves uh, to be distributed uh, distributed out. Uh, we have disposable aprons that are available. Uh, we're looking at about 4,000 uh, of those. Um, we are putting sanitizer stations in all schools. Uh, we have the dispensers uh, and stands. We're working on getting all the stands in, uh, how to put those together. Uh, but we will have enough of those to put throughout uh, the school buildings as well as our um, central offices. Um, we're looking um, for those for strategic areas, probably three to four of those stands. Uh, but then we're also supplying uh, sanitizer for the classrooms that um, do not have sinks uh, available. We have, as you know, uh, they say soap and water, the, the antibacterial soap and water is the best thing. A lot of our classrooms, a majority of our classrooms have the sinks. So we're making sure that we have that soap um, on hand and available. And that's what I was talking about earlier uh, with the um, supplies that we have. Um, so we're looking at that as well, as well as purchasing large amounts of the sanitizers to refill uh, the, the uh, pump bottles that we have uh, at the schools now, plus on hand uh, at the central office. A lot of things we have different sizes. So I don't want to go through all of those, but just to let you know that we do have them. I have been distributing the, I hate this word, but the sneeze guards uh, for the uh, front offices for now. We have some more on order uh, to look at possibly putting those in the um, media centers as well. So those are some items that we have on hand. We also have been working with HR and um, staff members who have called with um, medical needs or different things that they need a specific um, a specific item. Uh, and we're working with those to try to supply those uh, as needed. So uh, that's, that's just a quick uh, update on the PPE inventory that we have. So um, just pause there for any questions uh, that any board members may have. I think we're good. Okay, thank you. The next thing is what you see on your screen now. Um, this was developed through uh, or in cooperation with the District 4 Health uh, and the State uh, Department of Public Health. Uh, we met a couple of times looking at these, trying to figure out the best ways to do them. 
what we've broken down and, and what we see here are elementary and middle. We are still working through high school because there are so many moving parts to high school and students uh, that are coming and going. We are, are trying to nail all of that down. We will have it hopefully uh, not too much longer in the future. Um, but the three categories that we have are if we get notification uh, from a parent that a student has symptoms prior uh, to coming to school, we have some protocols in place that if a student makes it to the school itself, to the door, and we catch the symptoms, and then we also have if they start exhibiting symptoms throughout the day. So what you see there is on the first page is if we receive prior notification, uh, naturally we're gonna ask the parent to keep the child at home uh, and then to also have the parent contact their healthcare provider uh, to follow up with the cause of the symptoms. Because um, as we know, this could be uh, many different things that but we're concerned about what they are. So we're asking them to follow up with their health care provider and provide documentation to us. One of the things we are looking for is based on public health and CDC, uh, we find symptoms start to manifest themselves uh, 40, within 48 hours of uh, contact. Um, so we once we find out uh, the uh, result of the test, if it's a negative test, then we will continue on as we normally would, but that student would stay uh, isolated at home uh, just as a precaution uh, for the um, 14 days uh, that's required by um, the, the CDC or public health. If we get a positive, uh, we try to uh, look back at the 48 hours um, prior to uh, the symptoms to see if there was contact within the classroom. It could have happened that, uh, as I said, symptoms may have occurred over a weekend or night of a Friday night, those kind of things. Um, if there was no contact with other students, again, we isolate that student uh, and, and continue and we monitor our students here. If we find out that there is a positive uh, testing um, within the 48 hours, we will notify uh, all of the parents within uh, that classroom uh, that have been in there with the, the students um, and uh, isolate that class for an additional 12 days. As we said, we have the two days prior, uh, but we also have added there because of um, the presence of COVID in, in a house or in a home that siblings are also exposed there and they are a first level exposure. So we would ask siblings whether they are at that grade level or an addition, uh, another grade level to also stay at home for that period of time uh, until the sibling is cleared. Uh, moving to the second um, item is, is symptoms uh, at the door. Again, we're gonna isolate that student there at the school. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to head off before they ever uh, come in in some cases is car riders. We're going to be working with uh, principals. We are um, you know, going to be checking temperatures at the doors when they get there. But especially with car riders, uh, we're going to ask principals to, to work with us and work on a plan to actually take temperatures in the car rider line before the students exit their vehicles. That way, if we detect something, the student never enters the building. Uh, the parent can then uh, return the student to the house. So we have that, uh, but I will get to some of that in a minute. Uh, have a uh, parent again contact the healthcare provider and provide documentation. Again, if we have negative COVID, we continue as normal. If we have a positive COVID, then we're going to look at two different scenarios. If the student was a car rider, they've had no contact with other students within the 48 hours, we will continue and monitor our students. If they have had contact within 48 hours, we're going to isolate the class and siblings as we did prior. If the student is a bus rider um, and there has been no contact previously, um, we will continue as normal. If there has been contact, we will isolate the class that that student belongs to, uh, any siblings and also the other riders of that bus. Okay, so we would notify parents uh, of that. 
So if we have symptoms during the school day, if you'll go down to the third page. Uh, for the school day, um, we're going to isolate that student. We are identifying rooms within the building uh, other than the nurse's station because we don't want the students um, with those symptoms staying in the nurse's station while other students may be coming up. So we will identify an isolation room, and in some cases we may have more than, than one room. So we will isolate them there uh, to send them home. Uh, I know that we've had a question come up about what if a parent can't come get them. Um, they don't have transportation of something of that nature. We are working with our transportation department um, to work out a way to transport that student home on a bus. Uh, we will put safety precautions there in place to make sure we get them there. So we once that happens, again, parent will contact health provider, provide documentation. Uh, if there is a negative COVID, we're going to continue and monitor our students. If there is a positive COVID, we go into those two scenarios again. Is this student a car rider? Is this student a bus rider? And we move forward there. No contact, well, car rider and there has been contact. Uh, we're going to isolate the class and siblings. If it's a bus rider, there has been contact. We're going to isolate the class, any siblings and bus as well. So those are the three uh, scenarios that we have uh, worked up at this point, like I said, in conjunction with um, Department of Public Health he and also our District for uh, Health. Uh, if we go on down to the bottom, you see um, there's a note. Uh, I don't know what has happened here. Uh, I apologize. If um, at any time uh, during the process, the number um, of isolated classes reaches 50% of the established academic classes within there, whether um, there's been necessarily uh, contact in each of those, we will close the school for a minimum um, of three days, um, 72 hours. That will give us time. Uh, because rooms have to be isolated for 24 hours before we can go in and clean based on CDC recommendations. Also, um, for, um, sorry, um, the next 48 hours in order to uh, clean the, um, the affected room. Uh, there was two other things, if you'll bear with me one second. Apologize. For some reason that's not pulling up. Mr. Akins, if you have other information, other, I mean, I know you're looking for that, but if uh, if not, then maybe we can answer those questions. And then if you were to find that, we could circle back around to you. Yes, sir. I, I have it here. I won't be able to share it, uh, but if you would, um, the first one is for any negative test result, we will follow the recommendations of the healthcare provider. So if the healthcare provider says that the student needs to be isolated uh, for a period of time, we will follow those uh, and continue um, as normal in the classroom while monitoring the other students. Also, uh, per information from the Department of Public Health, when we receive information of a positive test, we're going to uh, send uh, home the class for the an additional 12 days, which I mentioned that uh, during that. Students who have not exhibited symptoms during that time will be allowed to return uh, to school after those additional 12 days um, after, of a home period. Um, and students should also be afforded virtual learning during the time that they are uh, isolated at home. 
Uh, and then the last part there was uh, about uh, the process of closing if we reach a 50% of the established uh, classroom uh, or school um, for a period of 72 hours in order to allow us to, to clean with the 24 hour period of the sitting of the room as well as the um, 48 hours to sanitize. Mr. Akins. Yes, ma'am. Um, how many how many potential days could an, could an isolated class remain an isolated class? I'm a little confused. Well, CDC recommends the, the 14 days. Um, and, and based on our <clears throat> conversations with the 48 hours, <clears throat> I'm sorry, with the 48 hours um, of contact prior, we're, we're adding the um, 12 additional days uh, for the for the 14 day total. And then another thing we have to consider as as a as a team. Okay, so you have kids that are sent home for the 14 days, I guess, is that what you're saying? And then um, child care for that end of those children that are sent home that 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 kind of concerns me a little bit. Um, because those are the parents probably that are working anyway uh, that have chosen the in in brick and mortar choice, um, and I and I know there are no easy answers. So I'm just kind of talking out loud. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Any additional questions for Mr. Akins or Mr. Akins? Will you finish first? Yes, sir. That that's okay. what I have. Any do, we, do we know in our community how long it takes to get the results of a test back? You know, you hear that on the news that it's getting longer and longer in some areas. Well, you have several tests that are out there. The, the rapid test, uh, if you can get the rapid test, um, is within 15 to 20 minutes once the um, test has been taken. And then they also send that off for further testing, uh, which takes, according to them, three, three to five days. Uh, to get the results, but um, we, are, we are. Is that the norm, three to five? I, I don't really know. I mean, you hear all kinds of numbers on the, on TV. Yes, that what you hear a lot of times depends on where someone goes. If they go to a private practice to have it done, mm -hmm. sometimes it could take longer. Uh, if you go to the Department of Public Health, um, there are many that offer <clears throat> the um, rapid results tests, uh, some do not. So it, it's kind of depending on where you go and that that could be different based on what uh, provider is used. But typical for that, that second test is, is three to five days is what um, I've been given. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Akins, um, well, you have Mr. Wheeler uh, come on the line to answer the nutrition question. Yes, Mr. Wheeler, um, I think he's online. I saw him a moment ago. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Brown, would you mind asking the question again? So I, I want to make sure it gets asked correctly. I'm sorry. Say that again, Mr. Aiken. I, I was just wondering if you would ask the question about the, uh, that you had in the 430 meeting for Mr. Wheeler, I don't want to misrepresent um, the question. Uh, if you'd like, no I'll, problem I'll, at I'll, all. Okay, thank you. Hey, Mr. Wheeler, how are you today? I'm doing well, sir. How are you? Man, I am marvelously well. I'm a small town country boy, so I'm happier than a pig in slop. All right. <laughs> um, so, my question to you is um, a lot of the constituents are reaching out wanting to know if they choose. Um, to keep their scholar at home, um, will we be able to still feed them as we have done at the start of the pandemic and as we're doing during the summer? So um, I'm not sure what needs to happen and all that. My understanding is that Mr. Wheeler is the expert in that. And so um, I would love for you to address that and give us maybe some 
options, um, maybe a letter date if we need to, some options that um, would support us being able to keep this going for our, our, our families. Okay. Because right. everybody knows that, you know, you know, food inequities, you know, that is something that happens in every community. And we've all seen it. And we know that scholars, some scholars come to school to, to get that good meal. And so we don't want, I don't want, I know other board members don't want that to stop. And so can you just give us some information about that? I'll be happy to. <clears throat> when school closed out in March, we went into an emergency feeding through the um, COVID emergency feeding, same the summer program. When we did that program, um, all the students were able to eat meals. We were able to provide meals at certain locations to every student at the free rate. Um, when we start back in the regular school year, we're no longer on the emergency feeding. We're now under the National School Lunch Program and it differs, but yet it's similar and it's still the same. And what I mean by that, um, the, the way the meals were generated or the way that we were reimbursed during the same summer piece, um, it was just a difference in the uh, way that we had to account for it. And then in other words, any student, any child under 18 could receive a meal when we first did the emergency feeding from March until we start back on the first day of school. Now, when we have a uh, school startup, there have been three waivers that we've all been approved that Griffin Spalding has been approved for. I received confirmation from the state director today. We have the uh, meal time, meal times waiver and what that does that allows us to we're talking about a either all virtual or or a, a blended model that will allow us to have um, serve meals multiple meals to those students that's doing virtual learning um, on certain days and certain pickup times um, we have the parent pickup and that would and this is where it differs and this is the key piece um, under the national school lunch program in this um, parent pickup, the parent can pick up the meal for the student at the school. Whereas when we were under the emergency feeding, any child under 18, regardless of, you know, preschoolers or whatnot, could could receive a meal. But because this, the National School Lunch Program is based on enrollment, um, so it's going to be specific child, specific school at their reimbursement rate. In other words, your free students, your reduced students, and your paid students are all um, reimbursed differently. So the students, we're, we have a electronic um, meal payment system that's going to have to be involved. We're going to have to have a different accountability system, whereas during the summer, the students could just, the parent could just say, I got three kids and pick up meals for that. But now we're going to have to have the student name, student ID information. We're going to have to watch for redundant meals. Um, that's so we have the parent pickup waiver, we have the meal times waiver, and we also have at the high school the waiver approved for we don't have to do the offer versus serve, we can serve bulk meals multiple days at the high school level. So, in answering your question, yes, we'll be able to offer meals virtual to virtual students, but it's going to be offered based on their status, um, and it's going to only be for enrolled students. It will not, it we, we won't be able to serve any child in the district as we've done so far. Thank you, Mr. Wheeler. And now let me ask you this, because I represent District 1. Um, more elementary is in my district, Atkinson is in my district. And I know that while we were feeding throughout the summer, I mean, through now and through the pandemic, one of the things is that uh, students who are at um, more elementary um, cannot get to Atkinson, can't get to Griffin High. Um, can't get to any area that is like, you know, that is out there. And so what are we going to do to ensure that students in the, in the schools where there's a higher population of free lunch, that we're going to ensure that those scholars are able to eat? Okay. One thing you will not see is a difference in the amount of service that we provide to any different school because that's considered overt identification. So I can't, we won't make sure that we're paying more attention to one particular school based on their free and reduced percentages as the other one. There will be, I believe there's some efforts or some discussion talking about um, a combination of us preparing meals and having perhaps the transportation help us to deliver those meals 
um, I'm going to have to, Mr. Akins can help us with that piece of it. But um, we will provide, and that's one of the things that's, kind of, that's really beneficial with the numbers for what we're looking at as far as virtual students and those students um, that are going to be in the brick and mortar buildings. We're going to provide or produce meals for those populations. What we're going to try to do, because we have a, a, a combination of inventory, we're going to try to, you know, when you're dealing with younger kids, you've got to consider the safety piece. But we also have, you know, the, the desire to put some more hot, item not necessarily hot but we have to be concerned with the safety but something other than just the prepackaged meals so those students that are at more um, or any other school we're going to try to use some of the inventory to you know to um, you know give them some different varieties but also when we're doing those virtual meals we have to deal with the safety time temperature control those things that's going to make that meal we got to make sure the safety is the primary so we want to try to you know, do some variety, but consider the safety piece. But every school will have the same amount of focus and attention as far as the service and providing meals to any child that wants a meal. Right, and I know that we, we, we you know, I just always gonna shout out my district and make sure that, um, you know, my district has, and the schools in my district have the resources that they need. And so um, mm -hmm. that's why I said that using more as an example. Um, and I, I guess, if we're talking along the same lines, maybe this question is for Dr. Kennedy, but thank you so much, Mr. Wheeler. Um, okay. Dr. Kennedy, we know that today there were at least over 80 people still trying to sign their children up for virtual learning. Um, have there been talks about extending the deadline so that you guys can capture more of that information? We have discussed that, uh, Mr. Brown. At this point, we needed to capture this information of the 4,224 um, that have signed up so that we can start looking at allocations and staffing uh, so that we can get some type of baseline and planning. The longer we leave that kind of open at this point, the less time we're gonna have to be ready for school if we're talking about having uh, teachers allocated for remote learning and teachers allocated for on-campus learning. So we need to be able to find out what our capacity and capabilities are regarding staffing both of those areas. Uh, if there's a point after we, once they've been able to identify what that uh, capability and capacity is, if we're able to reopen at that point would be a better time than us stopping that work midstream right now and then delaying the planning process from moving forward. Because we're really uh, getting down to the wire when we're talking about the start of school, which is approaching quickly. Yes, and thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for that. And I'll turn it back over to Mr. Akins. All right, Mr. Brown, thank you. I wanted to follow up on uh, something Mr. Wheeler said because we have been working and I've been working with Mr. Harris with transportation uh, and working with Mr. Wheeler trying to sort through how we could do this. Uh, at first, you know, we didn't have the waivers to be able to serve both. Um, but now we're able to serve, we could serve the students there in the brick and mortar building as well as students uh, who are on virtual uh, again depending on um, their status um, and uh, working at possibly doing the the multi-day meals but not quite exactly what we were looking here one of the things that we talked about is possibly um, delivering uh, twice a week so we would say maybe tuesday thursday uh, so Tuesday, we would do a, a meal package for two days. So there would be that Tuesday, Wednesday, or Tuesday, Wednesday, the morning of Thursday. Um, then on Thursday, we would deliver for Thursday, Friday, and the following Monday. Uh, because as you know, we can only serve for days that are school days. Uh, but working, yes, uh, doing that so that uh, working with our staff to have the ones there, fixing meals for the students uh, that are there up through lunch. Uh, of like Monday and then spending the afternoon putting together the meals uh, Monday afternoon and Tuesday morning that would be delivered out uh, on Tuesday afternoon. But yeah, we would have to, you know, just do some uh, communication with our parents of, of which ones would need that and then work with Mr. Harris to develop um, bus routes to make sure we can get those delivered. All righty. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. 
I have a, one more question for Mr. Akins, Mr. Okay. Chair. Okay. Uh, Mr. Akins, you have said the, the, the 48 hours for children as far as the isolation, is that correct? Uh, we go back 48 hours for to try to determine contact um, with that with the student that has the symptoms. Because I, I'm, you know, I've done a lot of research on this, as I'm sure a lot of people watching and and our team team has in our cabinet. You, you know, I've just heard that I uh, read that average day of onset of symptoms is five to six days, but it can be up to fourteen days. So I'm just concerned about. Well, is that I, forty-eight hours enough? I guess is my question. Uh, my understanding of the 14 days is this the the virus to run its course from uh, getting it and as i said we, i worked with department of public health and district four public health and the information they gave me was the 48 hours okay i'm just a little i'm a little kind of worried about that but i understand miss so there's so much information out there it kind of starts to boggle uh, after a while that's why i decided to go or not decided but we knew we had to go to the experts uh, in the medical field to get that information sure i totally have a lot of respect for that thank you um mr chair, mr. Also, chair. Have, oh sorry go ahead let mr akins to finish i'm sorry okay. mr brown I, I did want to see if you guys wanted to hear i did have mr uh, ballard on here with us tonight because I know there was a question about our ventilation in the schools uh, and just wanted to see if if that is a topic that uh, you would like for us to address as well and if so I have him uh, in the meeting tonight to discuss that yes please thank you okay uh, Bruce are you on yes sir okay can you hear me yes yeah. okay so anyway, just, just to give a little clarification, um, of course, there's certain design standards that we have to go on with school construction um, and, and what we have to utilize to, to be able to qualify our construction and, and meet the guidelines. So everything right now, you know, currently meet the guidelines and the requirements that, that are out there. Um, we do have um, other things in place that we do things a little more um, and have over the years than um, sometimes is recommended or sometimes other systems do. Um, one thing that, that we do, most of our design um, is actually based on that our uh, mechanical engineers design our HVAC systems to um, are based on a MERV 6 or MERV 7 uh, filter rating. Um, we have chosen, and there had been some debate over the years and going back and forth with the engineers to actually use uh, MERV 8 filters um, for all of our filters. Um, we felt that that's a, a good um, quality filter and um, a filter that, that we get good service from. They're um, concerned with some of our units because of being designed for less um, a lesser MERV rating is that it, it, the higher you go, the more restrictive um, and the airflow is, and it, you don't get quite as much airflow if you go with a, with a heavier MERV. But they did agree after looking at some of ours when we went through that, that it, it was close enough that they felt that the system would still operate um, well. Um, in addition to that, what the engineers have recommended and what you see out there a lot of times when you're looking at your at your home filters and, and things that you redo them on your HVAC system um, is that you change those filters every three months, um, you know, as a minimum kind of monitor with that, um, you know, depending on conditions, they may need to be more, but um, but in general, the, the three months is a good recommendation. And so Again, over the years, um, we had monitored. We have a company that, that actually comes in and changes out the filters for us. And, uh, and we had, had determined a number of years ago that um, every other month um, served us better. So we, as opposed to the, the three months as recommended, uh, we change our filters every two months uh, throughout our system. So 
uh, again, to, to make sure that our air is good and clean and that we are um, doing a, a little little better than, than just the, the basics out there. So currently, you know, we're continuing to monitor at, at any, we have a lot of HVAC units out there any given day, we can have something that breaks down or, or something that's impacted. But um, we have a good crew on hand and, and they're able in generally to go out there and get things operating again, um, very quickly. Um, we do have a, a some situations where if it's a larger piece of equipment that it may take a few days to get a, a component or um, you know a motor or a compressor that breaks down but um, but again we can usually service those relatively quickly and, and keep that um, airflow and movement out there in the schools going well um, what we have in a lot of times if it's individual classrooms that we have a, um, a situation in you know, if, if their need um, arises, we, we actually have some temporary um, standalone units that we can take out there for to take care of a classroom or office areas and things like that uh, while we're getting the part. So, um, again, we, we try to go over and above in that have for years, um, even before this this situation came about with the pandemic and uh, and want to continue to do our best at uh, keeping our air clean and um and flowing in our schools all right thank you very much anything else mr akins can i ask mr ballard a couple of questions sure thank you mr chair hey bruce hey uh two things really number one um i have been contacted by numerous and i mean numerous elementary teachers with regard to the types of furniture they have in their schools versus the types of furnitures, furniture we have in middle and high school, uh, specifically round tables versus uh, desks, so to speak. How are we going to assure a teacher that he or she in an elementary school can pro uh, social distance children at a table, at a round table? That's my first question. Okay. Um, well, now that we have these numbers, you know, from the, the students that are taking the virtual approach, that gives us much better information to go in and start looking at these classrooms individually to, uh, to kind of see how we can best lay them out. Um, again, it's been kind of the standard over the years and, and recommendation that, of course, pre-K have their own furniture or all their own um, items that they each have to have in their classroom. But kindergarten through um, second grade, we have generally used tables as opposed to desks because that's just worked better for those grade levels. Sure. Um, so, you know, in those situations, we um, we have those desks out, or the uh, tables out there now, and we can kind of see with these new numbers coming around um, if we can um, make sure we, we keep the social distancing um, while utilizing a table. If not, um, because of the fact that we have so many desks in schools and, and now we're not gonna have as many students in the schools, we can certainly take take desks from other areas and, and put those in the classrooms and work out some of those details. Um, now, as we start setting this up based on our student numbers that we're dealing with. Okay, second question, thank you. Uh, second question is that, um, uh, one of my major concerns, and I mentioned this on July 8, is the a number of custodians we have in each of our buildings uh, and with the requirements that are going to be on that particular team, uh, have we hired any additional custodians to help the ones that we already have in these buildings? Um, at, at this time, we have not hired any new custodians. Um, one thing, you know, we've talked and looked at some various options. Uh, my concern, as, as with yours, um, is usually if, if with the custodians we have there in general, um, if everybody works together and, and the custodians can do their job, if they're there, um, we can cover most of the efforts. The problem comes in where if you have a situation where because of various sicknesses or whatever may come about that you have sometimes you know a couple of your custodians missing which in some cases is 
basically half or half or more of your custodial staff, then we have an issue because used to we had floater custodians that if we had an issue at a school and a virus went around or something in the past and you needed to, to supplement those custodians or, or actually go in and handle those um, that building, we had some floaters that could do so. But at the moment, we, we do not have the floaters, so we don't have the additional custodians that we can, can put in at a moment's notice. So, yes, that's a concern with, with some of these issues there. Um, one of the things that we talked about in, in the possible means to overcome some of this, again, um, we've been talking with the numbers and, and with bus routes maybe being lower than normal or, or, or how they are, we're not having as many, not having field trips, maybe not as much many other um, events that we could possibly um, reach out and see if, if some of these bus drivers, and Mr. we talked to Mr. Harris about this, he feels that he usually has a, a good core number of uh, bus drivers that would like to do additional work, have other options to make a little more money and they may not have as many opportunities this year. So we may be able to bring some of those in to help supplement um, some of that effort with our custodians. And um, if we could do that, I think that would give us some relief and, and hopefully help out some of those um, employees as well. And uh, again, as we kind of see, you know, how to move forward now with the schedule and some of our numbers, uh, we're going to be able to work out some of those details a little better than um, we've been able to do up until this time because we really didn't know the numbers. Well, I'm going to tell you, the, uh, I said it in, on July the 8th, and I'm going to say it again tonight. I, I do not want and I do not desire for our teachers to have to clean their own rooms. And I'm very concerned that we don't have additional custodians at this point in time. Um, I think every building probably ought to have a part-time person um, because, you know, as the kids are still going to throw up if they're in the buildings. <laughs> They're still going to get sick. They're still going to drop their lunch. They're still going to, you know, turn their milk over, blah, 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 blah. And I, you know, this is, these are the, the two things that really bother me um, as a board member, the furniture um, and the, the lack of custodial help at this point in time. That just, uh, that's not good for me. Well, one thing, again, we were talking about with the, uh, with the bus drivers is with even an option to have at least, one per school addition we could put in there so that would hopefully give you know that additional uh, person out there that could give you a, a little bit more of a comfort level and i guess one question for you you know it, it's never been our intention we certainly don't foresee or or desire to have teachers cleaning their rooms um basically you know in the past when this first came about and what we had asked to do was something that a lot of these um, teachers already do, um, you know, and have been doing for years would, would be like kind of do a little sanitizing, clean areas of concern when they leave the, you know, their rooms in the afternoon. And what we had, had done at the time before we were getting out was just provide them with some of our um, sanitizing spray and just allow them to, to spray the room down of the areas and just to sanitize that. It just air dries and and then it's ready to go the next morning. Um, so that was all that we were really, you know, asking them to, to do any, any difference. So do, do you have a problem with just that effort? Um, because again, we're, we're certainly not intending to, uh, the teachers to clean the rooms. The custodians are going to clean the rooms like they always have. No, but as a former teacher, I did a lot of that myself. I just, you know, I just, uh, I just want to be, uh, doubly sure that our teachers do not have that requirement because they they've got enough on them anyway with regard to what we're all going through and trying to make proper decisions for our teachers parents and kids and um i'm just really concerned about that because uh it, it bothers me that we don't have any additional on hand uh, that just really bothers me okay well, um the, uh, if I, mr chair I'm I'm I... for bruce um mr chair uh, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Um, I have a question for Mr. Ballard for Bruce. Okay, go ahead. All right, Mr. Ballard, how are you today? I'm well, sir. Good. Thank you for your time earlier today. Uh, just one more question. So we know that there have there have been staff members who have contracted COVID-19 in Griffin's Baldwin County School System. We know that. 
That is not a secret. We know that. What additional cleaning has been done at that school or at other schools uh, that will make it safe? Good question. Uh, okay. Um, again, like you say, we we are aware that there are people that have have um, have tested positive. Um, again, we haven't had a situation that I'm aware of, at least, where um, you know they we've had an incident in a building where they they come in, they've tested positive, and and then you know had to spread around. Luckily, we hadn't had many people in the building. But any case where we where we have it, um, you know, that's we, we have any that that's come about, um, those areas will be further sanitized and clean. As Mr. Aiken said, the recommendation is that um, you wait at least 24 hours before entering the rooms to clean them. If you have an, an area that's been affected and, and you have a, a known case in those rooms, so again, we have to, have to kind of depend on. Um, HR and the staff to let us know, you know, where we might need to, to do the additional cleaning and, um, you know, set up those time frames and parameters as we move forward. And so when you talk about they've been sanitized and clean, what does that look like for the general public that's watching it, for the parent that uh, wants to send her, the mother, father, family that wants to send their child to school? When you say it's been sanitized and cleaned, what does that process look like? What what um, products have been used? Are there products that the CDC wants people to use? Is it just regular, you know, I bring you a couple cans of Lysol or whatever. What does that look like? Buildings have been properly cleaned and sanitized. Yes, sir. We um, the, the products that we use are, are sanitizing um, products. Uh, any additional cleaners that, that we have on hand are all items that were um, basically put out and approved on that CDC list um, for for maintaining and controlling the coronavirus. And so we, we have used that as we purchase products, as we put things together. Um, same thing, just like with basic hand sanitizers and stuff. So we make sure that it has the, the proper amount of, you know, alcohol content and so forth, you know, to, to make sure that it's done right. And in those at various areas, um, you know, that means you're going to go in there and, and you're going to, once that 24 hours is up and, and our staff will go back in there, they'll, they'll go back in with with their mask and gloves and, and gowns, things they need to have on to protect themselves. And they will go in with um, a quat pro product. Uh, we use a lot of lemon quat. We also are now getting some mint quat. Um, that's a, a Buckeye chemical product that is on that list and recommended for um, the control of, of coronavirus. And um, and they will go in and they will, after cleaning that room, they will spray that room down and, and sanitize and wipe down all those uh, potential areas that um, of touch and locations where these, um, you know, anyone that had the a known case um, would have possibly been in contact with and uh, involved with. Okay. And that goes for their offices, their restrooms, you know, all the doors in and out that they've touched and everything. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. And Mr. Chair, I have no further questions. I know that we need to get through uh, the rest of the questions. I know Dr. Saul still needs to speak and a couple others. And so um, I'll just reserve my um, comments until um, it's time for the discussion. Okay. I just had one more short question for Bruce while he's here. Is there has there been any additional training for our custodial staff to this point? Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, you know, initially when this all started up, um, we had gone through and 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 talked to them about the importance. Some of the things that we also put in place were. Um, with them and as well as the administrative staff at the schools is to note, you know, any place in the building where we had people coming and going, uh, where we could then go behind those and sanitize. And that's been since school was let out. We wanted to be sure that um, every day uh, we knew where people were in the building, and where we could be sure that that was, was properly done. So we put um, other efforts in place to, to monitor and try to hold people accountable. Um, that areas are being adequately cleaned and we plan to, to continue to do that 
um, and, and actually um, increase some of those areas as we go forward. Um, Mr. Akins and I were just talking today about um, some checklists in each classroom uh, for all of the high touch areas and, and points out there. We were already doing it in the restroom areas. Um, so again, you know, the, just stressing the accountability of this um, and that people take it seriously and, and do their job and, and with the cleanup efforts and what needs to be done and accomplished out there. It's very important. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Smith, I think you were gonna to try to say something. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to tell Ms. McDonald, we're, obviously the cleanliness of the buildings is key. Uh, that's what uh, people expect. That's what gives the confidence they can go back into the building and, and be as safe as possible. Um, we do know that there are, there are no guarantees. Uh, things do happen, but we can take all the precautions that, that, are, that are prudent to do and even go above and beyond many of those. Uh, I think the comment that now that we have an idea of the number of, of students who may be in our classrooms versus those who wish a, a virtual option is going to provide us information. We need to look at the options that we do have with the staff we've got. You know, one of our real keys has been to make sure that we don't have to lose staff, but it may be that under this, we have to find a different way to use staff. And that's what we looked at as part of this. And as Bruce mentioned, the idea of uh, perhaps, um, you know, some of the staff that may not, you know, drivers or others that may not have um, additional uh, field trips or those that they've been relying on during the day to come in and help. Maybe one way to actually help them to, to be able to continue to work with us. And so this gives us a chance to do that. But please know that the safety of our students and our staff is foremost. And the work that Bruce has been doing uh, has been aimed toward that and we're going to continue to do that thank okay. you thank you dr kennedy uh, now we're move on to the staffing uh stephanie dobbins will be sharing uh the plan for the on-campus teacher and the remote learning teacher stephanie Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Um, as, as Dr. Kennedy mentioned, we have 4,224 students that have signed up at this point for virtual learning. So HR and finance will work together to reallocate our positions, to designate the positions, not the people, the positions as virtual or on campus. Um, there are multiple routes to virtual teaching. Um, uh, you know, again, we've reiterated um, several times this evening, our employees safety and wellness and that of our students is our top priority. So we've had a um, confidential medical accommodation process open. Um, we've got several employees, not just teachers, but in different types of position that positions that have been applying for accommodations. And those can be as simple as um, the school system providing a face shield or other types of personal protective equipment, all the way to approval to um, virtual teach from home. So as far as um, the routes to virtual teaching, this accommodation process would, of course, get priority over any other route. Um, then additionally, we have advertised for teachers to apply to be a virtual teacher. And so it has become apparent during this process that we're not getting enough applications to meet the need um, based on this 40 something percent system wide. So we will have to ask additional teachers to, um, to work as a virtual teacher that have not applied through the accommodation process or the application process. But after we allocate the positions, the principals will select the teachers. Um, we're not dictating from the system level who gets those um, assignments. The principals know their people and who is going to be most effective in what role. And so they will definitely um, be working to do that very quickly. We do have um, meeting scheduled with principals on Thursday and Friday of this week to work through this process. Um, we are planning for uh, virtual teachers to report to work to do their virtual teaching from the um, school buildings. We feel like we can provide 
the most reliable internet and support, technology support, support from administration, mentors, PLCs. Of course, we do have brand new teachers that we're hiring who have no teaching experience. We know they need to be in the building and have resources available close by to provide support to them. And of course, those with um, accommodations may be approved to work from home. Um, but all teachers, virtual and on-campus teachers, will work the same hours, work hours and work days. So do y'all have any other questions about um, staffing under option one? Any questions, board members? I do. Yes, Mr. Mr. Sorry. Go ahead, Ms. McDonald. All right, um, thank you, Mr. Grant. Okay, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, go I'll ahead, Mr. Okay. Okay. Steph, so my Steph, question Steph. is, <laughs> there's a delay. Stephanie, hey. Hey, Sue. If we if we uh, let's just say hypothetically we're going to do virtual, are we are are we prepared teacher wise to do that? Uh, yes, ma'am. We can make that happen because um, you know if you. Um, do 100% virtual. All of our teachers will be virtual. If we have this split, we can we can handle that also. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And my question is: the document that you're presenting today has that sent? Will that go out to staff as soon as possible? Well, I believe they have access to see it since it's posted with this meeting. But um, you know, we will be sharing and working directly with principals on Thursday and Friday. You know, we have new teacher orientation beginning tomorrow, so that's as soon as we could make those meetings happen. Um, so I, I guess well, I'll just go to the superintendent, Mr. Superintendent. Is there any way that you can ensure that I mean, it's already been presented, and so it's actually it's a working document or whatever. Can you make sure that every employee gets a copy of that we want to be sure that we send out the, the, the correct information for sure so based on what comes out of the meeting tonight we will get, make sure our staff knows what the deal is thank you all right dr kennedy all right so in other words you will not send out to the staff i'm confused i said that um based on what comes out of tonight's meeting we will get accurate information out to our staff yes okay all right i greatly appreciate it all right so for those uh persons who have messaged me um you've heard it you will see that document so that you can look at it a little closely um but i will go in and post it to my page um if the district is not willing to send out thank you Mr. Dobbins, do you have anything else? Uh, no, sir, that was all. Okay, Dr. Kennedy. So now we will move to the school calendar uh, and Sarah Jones will be sharing this information. She has met with the calendar committee uh, based on the September 8th date that was uh, decided by the board on July 8th. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Sarah Jones. Hi, good evening. It's good to see everyone tonight. Um, if I could, while uh, Joni is pulling up the September 8th start date calendar uh, that you have been sent, um, I, I wanted to give just a bit of a background on the calendar committee meeting that we held. Um, it was July 16th and we had representatives from our classified and certified staff. Um, we had administrators, teachers, parents, uh, a student representative, and the sentiment, uh, I know Mr. Brown was something that you said earlier, I very much appreciate those words, the, the collective effort from 31, 32 members of that calendar committee, um, it, it, was, it was remarkable. I left that meeting, honestly, just... Um, it, inspired a bit in how thoughtful I shared with Dr. Kennedy, just how thoughtful everybody was coming from every uh, position and trying to see 
um, everybody's um, side and, and requirements that we have wrapped around the calendar endeavor. Uh, so I, I want to just publicly thank every single person that um, uh, served on that committee and gave their feedback. Um, we had two draft calendars, but only as a springboard for discussion. Uh, you can imagine that seeing a blank calendar on the screen would be very difficult um, to work from uh, in, in a virtual environment. Um, we also had a uh, Google document up that we were collecting the feedback from the people on the committee um, that we could look at and certainly take into account in trying to build a calendar um, that's reflective of the September 8th start date uh, and take into account as much feedback as we possibly could um, in, in honoring um, some of those thoughts uh, that were given. So if I could just give that background, um, you were given in your packet of information um, the August 12th calendar that we know has to be revised, and I just wanted you to have that um, for context. The September 8th calendar uh, that you're seeing on the screen now, but there was also another document that um, went over calendar features uh, with the September 8th start date and just some considerations and implications that we need to um, just think through and work through. And so if I may start, thank you, Joni, for pulling that up. Um, the features of the September 8th calendar, um, because of the September 8th start date, through the end of the school year, we have 152 instructional days. Now, the calendar committee discussed different options in the event that instructional days may be increased. Um, so some of that was feedback as well. But right now, our current calendar with the September 8th start date is with 152 instructional student days. We, the calendar that I shared with you uh, has five school level professional learning days, uh, two, level, two school level PL days. The pre-planning uh, begins on Wednesday, July 27th, and I'll circle back around to some um, uh, of those other concerns in regards to start date of staff and start date of students. But for this calendar, the pre-planning does start Wednesday, July 27th. For the first day of school would be Tuesday, Sarah, September 8th. Sarah, Sarah, I hate to interrupt you, but I believe that should be Monday the 27th. Oh, my apologies. That doesn't Was get that confused out there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I appreciate you catching that. So um, the first day of school, again, would be September 8th for students. The fall break, um, October 12th through the 16th. It, it reflects a five-day Thanksgiving break. The last day of first semester is December 18th. It reflects the holiday break of December 21st through January 1st, the midwinter break for February 15th through the 19th, the five days of spring break and April 5th through the 9th, the last day of school for students at May 26th, uh, which is a Wednesday. I, I did look at that on the calendar, Mr. Smith, just to double check that. Uh, post planning, June 1st and 2nd for teachers and the days in the first semester reflecting these total 152 instructional days. It leaves 63 instructional days in the first semester, but it leaves 89 in the second semester. One of the things that we always try to do is get a, a balance in between as, as compared to first and second semesters. Um, and that's important for um, the instruction, the students having the opportunity to master content. Um, and right now, as this sits, there is um, some inequity in that piece from first semester to second semester. So if I may go into the considerations and implications uh, that are to follow, if I may go ahead and just read through some of these, I will circle back around, um, open for uh, discussion, and there are um, two of these that 
um, a, a decision would need to come out of tonight. But if, if you would just allow me to move through some of these things that have emerged that would be um, considerations and implications we would just have to work through with the current 152 instructional calendar. So the first one is pre-K funding concern as a requirement. Um, at the, there's a minimum of, of 160 student days um, from the Department of Early Learning. With student days at 152, we have an approximate funding loss of $175,000. I know um, Dr. Sauce, um, I know Dr. Sauce was this going could I could I just give a, a just a quick point of clarification on that point? I, I can't, Dr. Sauce. Do you mind if we just kind of cycle through these? Oh, and then I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to come right back. I'm going to come back to you on that. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, and so uh, the second piece here that you see uh, are programs that serve multi counties, such as Mainstay Academy and College and Career Academy. Uh, they're having to contend with varying start dates. Um, that really present some logistical um, problems that they are trying to solve and work through. Uh, dual enrollment classes are also uh, of concern as Gordon College and Southern Crescent start dates are weeks earlier than our September 8th start day for students. Um, transportation and food service also would, would need to be considered. Um, staff with school-aged children, um, those child care concerns with the number of uh, staff days on the front end of the calendar um, that came up as part of our calendar committee as well. Um, if I may just say that um, I know it was mentioned earlier in one of the presentations where they we talked about um, 190 uh, contractual days for teachers. And so um, the calendar that you see, I know um, there may be questions as to why there are many teacher days on the front end versus the back end. Uh, we were trying to be very cognizant of not go not going deep into June for staff. Uh, that was one of the pieces that came out of the calendar committee, but also um, there's going to be a lot of front end training that is going to need to take place with um, uh, Google Classroom. I know Ms. Dobbins mentioned the um, number of new staff and new teacher orientation that's coming up and, um, and also instructional supports that go with um, being able to help students master content um, such as um, Nearpod and, and some other things that might be embedded in that Google Classroom. So we were trying to accommodate that front end loading and planning. In addition, um, you'll see further down in some of the considerations, we will have many uh, things that have to be worked on and touched, such as pacing guides and um, assessments and, and those types of things that are built around the 175 student number of student days. So that is why uh, it, it is front heavy. In addition, um, the reason we have to back up and start in the month of July is for all for new staff members to our district. Uh, they have to be employed 30 days prior to that following month. And I hope I'm not messing up how to say that, Ms. Dobbins, but they have to uh, have been employed um, by that August 1st start date to receive benefits in September. If we go past that date, benefits are bumped to the following month and that they would not have benefits until October. So, uh, I'm, okay, good. Yes, that's correct, Sarah. Okay, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to, to share that information. Um, and also there are some implications for new teachers um, and new to the system teachers and uh, 13 paycheck timeline uh, that could be affected. Um, I, I just mentioned number five about that August 1st start date and benefits. 
Um, number six, uh, work schedules for job types um, will have to be updated. And the RCD for number seven and eight, I mentioned RCD um, curriculum pacing guides will have to be updated, as well as possible modifications to units and assessments, um, or they're going to need to take place. Um, Mastery Connect assessment modifications on the scoring side will have to be looked at. Um, we, the, uh, I've already mentioned about the unequal number of days in the, the first, as co first semester as compared to second semester. Um, so that presents great difficulty for all courses and those requirements being met in that short semester. Advanced placement, while that is also true for the advanced placement classes, um, advanced placement is still holding exams. Um, they, they will have those. And so the kids who take AP classes in that first semester will have 63 days to master that content. Um, and just all the while remembering we are on block. So we're not talking about a 50 minute or a 60 minute um, um, section or class for those students. And so uh, having 23 less days to prepare for that AP exam for those students in that first semester um, really looks a little bit longer. Um, but I just wanted to share that. Um, the concern in just awarding credit on block schedule with the reduced number of days. The uh, report cards will have to be touched. The report card um, schedule uh, will have to be looked at. Uh, we will have to probably go in and look at, at the standards-based report card pieces. Um, and also October FTE, just a, just a concern out there that the FTE count um, will be on October 6th. So the concern is in the event we have students um, uh, that fall into any kind of 14-day quarantine, it could impact our FTE count as students have to be present at least one of the 10 days prior for us to receive funding. So at that September 8th start date and October 6th coming up on the first um, FTE count, just that is a possibility. And, and again, the sports and athletics um, disruption again, and, and Mr. Akins can uh, correct me here, but I don't think GA, GHSA um, schedules, anything like that is, have been put out, but that just that is a consideration. So many of the things that I shared certainly are just considerations of work to be done, but I wanted to share that with you to help, um, help you understand the beginning of year days and why that looks the way it does is that we're trying to keep the 190 day teacher schedule. We're trying to accommodate staff members not um, losing benefits for a month. And we're also trying to front load and support staff in giving them time to have adequate training and to implement and plan for the students that they will be serving on September 8th. So um, if I may circle back around to the first two questions. Um, one was about the pre-K funding. Uh, Dr. Sauce, I know that you wanted um, to add some information here. Um, yes. we, will, we will need, um, I was sharing with Mr. Smith, we will need some uh, type of decision in regards to those number of days and that those monies lost or if we are going to change number of student days to get to the 160 threshold. Um, and I, I just needed to bring that before the board this evening. So, Dr. Foss. Yes, ma'am. Th thank you, Ms. Jones. And just to <clears throat> offer a, a little bit of additional uh, clarity and information regarding point one. Uh, very recently, we've gotten further uh, guidance from Department of Early Care and Learning around that matter uh, of number one, uh, around how they're determining and defining instructional hours. So uh, when Ms. Jones and her team put uh, this document together, we were operating under some different information. So to be clear, uh, that figure, that 175, if we remained at 152 days, we now have clarity now that it would, it would come in just under 150, uh, not quite the 175. So we'd be looking at, at less than that, but still we would 
would, uh, we would owe money back to the Department of uh, Early Care and Learning um, if we stayed at 152 days. And again, we're probably looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of just under $150,000 uh, rather than that 175 figure now that we have more information. I want to just offer that, that clarification. Thank you, Dr. Sauce. I appreciate that. Um, so I didn't know, Mr. Smith, if we wanted to um, open up that student day um, discussion or what the implications are with our district um, having to um, pay back the $150,000. Well, I think you've um, you've laid that concern out there just so that everybody's aware of that. Um, adding adding student days back to the um, to the calendar, of course, has a lot of implications. As as Sarah talked about, um, not only does it affect the pre K, but it also affects a lot of the other instruction that goes on in the district. Our original plan had been to for for uh, for teachers to use about the first two weeks of the school year as they appeared to kind of catch up uh, from what was missed in the spring and try to get kind of get, get students back onto a uh, back caught up and kind of up to speed before they even started tackling the new year's um, uh, curriculum i believe i'm correct in that uh, that was our plan so the 152 actually loses about you know 10 more days before you even start getting into the new year's curriculum so while we do have waivers on, on days, it does come with implications. And so I did want the board to think through that and be aware that um, you can't get as much done in, a, in 152 days as you can in a 175, obviously, but it does have implications to us. And as Sarah mentioned, there would have to be some work done in our curriculum documents to, to rework pacing and probably re-look re at um, the power standards in particular to see what what could be handled in that so kind of give you an idea from the board is there any um uh, any concern about the, the number of uh, days in the school year if we had to add student days back we it may also change the start date for teachers because uh, we teachers do have the 190 day contract it does it is fulfilled if we start on july 27 and go through that very first piece of the month of june but that did not include the additional student days that would have to be somewhere during a break or somewhere else we'd be back up into August or whatever. So in order to get that to work. So we kind of want to get your ideas on that. And then I know she'll go into another one later on about college and career and mainstay. My personal opinion is, is that when we made the decision to postpone that day, we realized that it was going to cause some implications. It was going to um, make things change, make things difficult. Uh, the last thing I want to do in um, supporting that change is make things harder on teachers, uh, make things harder on uh, the staff that have worked so hard to get us to where we are. And so I would, uh, I would be in favor of absorbing that $150,000. You would be in favor of what, Mr. Doss? Absorbing that $150,000, not extending the number of days, not trying to stretch out the days to 160 in order not to pay that $150,000. Well, the thing, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the thing that, that bothers me is that with the September 8th start date, and I think everyone that's watching and the cabinet and the governance team realizes what we were thinking at that point in time is just to give us more time to, to get ready, so to speak. Um, but as we know, in the situation of since July the 8th has changed tremendously too. Um, I'm worried about what I'm most concerned about, and I received a lot of emails and I've talked to a lot of teachers in the system that the September 8th start date is, is, is terrible for them to find childcare for their own family. It's very difficult. A lot of our daycare centers in our own city have closed because of COVID. Um, which ones will close tomorrow? And I certainly don't want to put our teachers and their families in a position where they have to 
take their children to a daycare they haven't had the opportunity to, to fully vet. Um, I, I just can't do that as an individual and I will not do that. So, and I certainly didn't realize the implications that we faced starting that late. Um, I do have a proposal on the table uh, that I sent to Mr. Smith and uh, the, the, the governance team. And I, I do want to further discuss that um, in just a few minutes, but I think we need to move back to perhaps the August 17 start date and teachers report on time. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, w would it be helpful if I provided additional context on the, um, the monies we might potentially owe back to uh, Department of Early Learning? That's, that's fine, but uh, you know, I realize that's not a, not, a huge, not a huge amount in the grand scheme, but uh, go ahead and, and, um, and uh, sure. do the context. Sure. sure. So for a benefit of the board and the public watching, just to give some additional clarity briefly. Um, so folks are reminded in our state, pre-K programs are not managed, certified, and authorized by the Georgia Department of Education. They are managed, certified, authorized, and monitored by the Department of Early Care and Learning, which is a completely separate department from the Department of Education with different regulations, different standards, different expectations, et cetera. So I wanted to be clear on that. Um, <clears throat> and within the state of Georgia, there is a requirement by the Department of Early Care and Learning that you provide a minimum of 1,170 instructional minutes for pre-K in the given school year. There is no ability to waive that or to, over, uh, to overlook those, those minimum number of hours uh, in the same way that waivers are granted by the Department of Education for other regulations and matters. Those, that, that's not the case with pre-K. Um, there, <clears throat> there is some flexibility in how the instructional day is defined um, based on uh, the moment children get off the bus to the moment children get on the bus to leave the school. So based on the way our bell schedule for elementary schools are configured, uh, from a pre-K perspective, that equates to 160 instructional days. Uh, and just another FYI, uh, not to cause more confusion, but Department of Early Care and Learning and Department of Education define the instructional day differently, just FYI. So from a pre-K context, we have a minimum number of 160 instructional days that we must provide uh, to meet that 1,170 minutes minimum in order to not owe back a prorated amount of money to the Department of Early Care and Learning. That is not something we have the ability to waive uh, with that department, um, the way Department of Education permits with other regulations. So I wanted to just offer that clarity. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, the uh, number two um, it talks about the multi, uh, the multi-service counties um, that play a part with Mainstay Academy, as well as the Griffin Regional College and Career Academy and the varying start dates. Now, I know um, after talking to um, um, the, talking to Thiago um, at Mainstay Academy, as Griffin Spalding is the fiscal agent, um, the, all the other counties follow Griffin Spalding's calendar. With that being said, the other counties where students come and are served um, have uh, early dates. And so there is the possibility um, as the LEA that we will have to provide services um, to students uh, even prior to the September 8th start date. And so um, he had been speaking with the program coordinator uh, for DOE and GNETS. And so I think um, Mainstay specifically was waiting for um, just the, the finalized piece tonight to be able to say and, and work with the other um, counties and um, service to students that may end up having to come prior to our opening. Um, and for College and Career Academy, um, again, uh, I'm not sure if um, Dr. Ergel is on the line or if uh, Dr. Warren uh, would want to speak to this piece, but I know that they've been working hard in regards to um, trying to work out <coughs> dual enrollment classes and service at College and Career Academy as the other two counties 
athletes uh, begin prior to us, as well as Gordon College and Southern Crescent uh, Technical College also uh, begin far sooner than the September 8th time frame. So, uh, Dr. Warren, did, did you want to speak on that? Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm present. I'm also Dr. Ergel is present. I'm going to let her address those concerns. Okay. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I did want to bring to the board and let you know that the GRCCA, we have been open since May, accommodating students trying to finish up their spring semester courses from Southern Crescent Technical College. So we've been open and we've had success with students coming in. We follow all the protocols that the CDC recommended. We followed all the protocols that um, Spalding County School recommended. And we have followed all the protocols that Southern Crescent Technical College asked us to follow. We should be finishing up, finishing up probably this week with the students that we've had in our building. Southern Crescent has also had some of our students in their building finishing up. So we've been open and we would really like to ask the board to consider to let us to remain open and accept students in August. All of our partners are beginning in August. Butts County is beginning on August the 4th. And my understanding is that they are doing um, virtual option or the in-person option. Pike County School System is starting August the 12th. They're coming back traditional and they're looking for their students to be in their building and in our building on August the 12th. Gordon State College is coming back on August the 12th. They are having um, their instructors come to our building if we will allow them to. They have come over, they've looked at the classrooms that we use. We have small classes with them. We have large classrooms here. They've seen how they can do the social distancing and they're happy to do that. Southern Crescent Technical College begins on August the 18th. They have stated that they would probably have a large number of their core academic classes be remote learning which means students have to be on the computer at the time of their course and sign in and participate. However, the um, technical programs will have some remote learning and then they would have to schedule up to a maximum of 10 students to come to the lab like we've done this summer and do their lab work. Then um, we do have some high school programs here too and they're going to be severely impacted if our Butts County students and our Pike County students can't come to those courses when they begin in August. Um, because if they're not available to them in August, then those students are all going to go back to Butts County and Pike County. They're going to have to put them back in their system and find them a schedule. So we, um, we have small numbers here. We have large spaces. Our aviation program is one of our high school programs. We've got that large hangar. We have the upstairs and the downstairs. So we definitely could social distance any students that came to us and wanted to begin in August. If um, Butts County students and Griffin Spalding County students, if they tell us, you know, no, we chose the virtual option, we'll do virtual, we will accommodate those students virtually. But we are asking that we can remain open and accommodate the students from Butts County, Pike County that want to begin in August in our building so that we don't lose that enrollment for our students. Thank you, Dr. Herkel. Well, uh, Sarah, let me, add, let me add this to it. Maybe um, be, being a multi-county operation like it is, it's important that we're all are able to let our students participate and, what we're kind of faced with at the moment is is uh, is some limitations. So what we're really asking the board to do is let us treat the College and Career Academy as a as a as a different type entity because it is multi-county. Allow these programs to start when we need to be able to do so in conjunction with Gordon and with Southern Crescent. Any of any of the the Butts County and Pike County students who are want to participate would be coming to that campus to do so. But we also need to let it be known to our own students in Griffin Spalding County that if they wish to participate in those programs, they will need to start at that time too. 
So even if we have a, even if we had a, a formal September rate opening, some of these other classes may well start early. Otherwise, our students are the only ones who won't be able to participate in it. So that's kind of what we're asking is, can we have that understanding that college and career is a different entity and, and allow it to open in a way that all three counties can participate, understanding that it may require some Griffin Spalding County stu students to start prior to the September 8 date. Sure, I, I don't have a problem with that. Okay, great. Me That's perfect. Me Is that good enough, Laura? Yes, that, and I was just gonna enough? make the point. Uh, a lot of our dual enrollment students, when they actually go to Southern Crescent campus or they go to the Gordon campus and they're not coming onto our campus, their schedules are different. Like their mm -hmm. breaks could be different. They could start at different times. So come here earlier than that proposed September 8th date, it's no different than if they were going to Gordon campus and following the Gordon calendar. Mm -hmm. Okay. I agree. Dr. Erbel, are you saying that Southern Crescent is, is open 100%? No, Southern Crescent is um, not open 100%. They are doing some remote learning. A lot of their core academic classes will be remote learning. And even some of their technical classes will be remote learning. But we would allow students to come in if the classes were meeting on our campus. And also for those technical programs, and students, including the instructor, to come in and do their labs. That's the way we did it this summer, and that's the way they're proposing to do it um, in the fall, to have students in the lab by appointment. So we make sure that students are spaced out and six feet apart. Okay. Ms. Jones, does that answer all of the questions that you needed? I know uh, the decision I just heard about GRCCA. Um, may I ask uh, about mainstay as well under that same umbrella? Um, it, while I know uh, Chiago Alessio, uh, they would still work with the, um, their program coordinator with the DOE and GNETS, they may not take that option, but that they have the option to know that they can work from, are we good with mainstay following uh, in, in line with GRCCA the same way? Yes. Okay. Any, any board member that isn't? I'm good with that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, also, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Smith, go ahead. I'm just saying thank you, appreciate it. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, um, and also just to, to throw it out there, if the board uh, would, would like me to do this, I did uh, indicate to Mr. Smith, um, just in an advocacy for students, I think I mentioned the off-balance semesters uh, with 63 days in one semester and 89 in another. Um, I, I did work out um, a calendar where uh, it would be more balanced where we could have 73 days in the first semester and 79 days in the second semester. Um, but it, it just means that the end of the semester will not naturally happen at the December 18th mark. Um, I have it here if you would like me to uh, present it up on the screen uh, to show you, Mr. Smith, if, if you're okay with that, board members, if you would like that or just to at least know I've, I've worked that out where it would be more equitable for students and I, I just I think that's I think that's important um, for the students trying to master that content in those number of days per semester. Okay. I trust you Miss Jones that the calendar is superb. <laughs> okay. Okay all right well uh, I think that's all unless there was any additional discussion um, from other considerations. So based upon what you just said, Ms. Sue, does that mean that you want to go with that calendar versus the other calendar? No, I'm just, I just, I just trust Ms. Jones and her team to have uh, done their work with regard to the split. Okay. And she's would, she's, she's would you like, doing that. Would you like to see that calendar? No. Because <laughs> I know it's I know it's <laughs> just know that it don't the only change the breaks all of those things are still the same the right. front end days for teachers the only thing it changes is the end of the semester will not fall at december 18th it'll fall in the month of january gotcha 
Thank you so right. much. Can we replace right. Columbus Day with Juneteenth? I'm sorry. I said, can we, and this ain't no laughing mm -hmm. matter, but can we replace I Columbus Day? Can we replace Columbus Day with a Juneteenth celebration? Well, Mr. Brown, I um, don't have that. You, as part you of were not supposed to respond. You parameters. They are not part of my calendar committee parameters <laughs> that I worked with, but uh, <laughs> we can certainly talk about that later if you want. Okay. Do Thank we have you, any Jeremy. other issues then that need to be addressed, Dr. Kennedy? Are we, is that everybody or? That's everyone that um, concludes the updates from the task force members. Okay, so does the school system then feel as though that we have the consensus of these things moving forward? I know Ms. Sue said that she had something that she wanted to discuss. Yes, is it okay, Mr. Chair? Well, I want to make sure that based upon that would be our concern tonight, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, we the, the option one was what came back overwhelmingly from our initial June survey of parents and, and staff came back, um, you know, somewhere upwards of you know 75 percent or so being chosen. It um, we also got uh, information out of our second survey that about 42, 43 percent of our students would like to choose the virtual option going into the school year and uh, so our plan was built around that calendar around the the start date that the board approved uh earlier uh, this month and so um we've worked hard with our department of public health as far as looking at their guidance and watching the governor's executive orders etc to be sure that we can meet those have put um put various uh, safety compliance features in place. Our plan did call for mandatory mask um, in particular places where social distancing could not be maintained. Uh, but we also know that by having fewer students in the school, it's going to be easier to do that. Plus, we can also work with the um, with the future issues that we talked about because that's part of the recommendations. And, and then, of course, the cleaning regimen also. So, um, I feel like our team has taken that date and worked through the implications, some of which were have been had to be addressed tonight. Uh, I'm very appreciative of the work they have done to, to take that in the last uh, 10 or 11 days and work up a plan. There's still there's still things to do, obviously, and that would be be, be done over these next few days. So I'd like to commend this um, this work to the board uh, for your consideration based on what had been approved earlier. Okay. I think it's important that we give each of the board members an opportunity to um, share uh, their thoughts and uh, ask any additional questions that you might have. And uh, I'm talking with Mr. Uh, Brown earlier today. He asked if he could go first on that. Actually, I'll, um, I can go now or I'll just, um, I can go after Ms. Sue. Either one, whoever would like to go first. I, I will, Mr. Doss. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, number one, I want to thank yes. all the parents and all the employees and all of the staff members of this county that have contacted me. I think I have had contacts from probably 300 people or emails, messages, phone calls. I put my number out there to get uh, information from anyone and everyone. So I just wanted to publicly thank parents and employees that have contacted me. Number two, I want to give thanks to Mr. Smith with regard to and his dedication to GSCS and what you have done for this system. I wish nothing for you but the best, and I can assure you I will be part of a smooth transition for the new superintendent coming in. So I wanted to thank Mr. Smith publicly for his service to this school system. And then I want to thank Dr. K and the cabinet for what you have done since our last gathering on July the 8th. But we do know things have changed since July the 8th. Um, the trends in our own community are not good. Uh, the trends in the state of Georgia are not good. And as much as I enjoyed seeing kids come to my classroom on the first day of school, I'm not real sure that I can send 1,800 people back to work with regard to what's going on in our own community. So tonight I'm going to propose uh, 
I had proposed uh, last week. I think I sent the email to my governance team on July 16th that we start in a virtual mode, 100% virtual mode with a July 7 return for teachers with a start date of school on August the 17th. I have talked to leaders in our system. I have talked to teachers in our system. Our leaders have convinced me that that extra week of planning will uh, allow them to get ready and be ready for the students in the virtual mode. I've always been one to not ask people to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. Um, it's a real safety issue for me. I cannot guarantee anyone's safety, um, but I can guarantee them to be safer if they are allowed to stay home and work or even come to school and work. Um, so I wanted to make a proposal about starting 100% virtually on August 17th with a comeback, our teachers report on July 27. This wasn't easy for me. Um, it's not easy for any of us. I've watched, uh, gosh, I can't tell you how many board meetings in the in the surrounding area all over this country. And uh, the positions we're in um, are very difficult at this point in time. But I just can't send people into situations that may be, uh, may be unsafe. And I'm really concerned about that we don't have any additional custodians at this point in time really concerned about that because I think we should. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm just uh, really worried about the furniture at the elementary level. I, as I mentioned earlier, I heard some so much from elementary teachers that, you know, they just don't have the furniture they need. Yeah, we can get it, but I don't know. Just have some reservations about that. So I propose we start on the 17th in virtual mode. Teachers report July 27th. And that'll solve a lot of the issues that, you know, we've heard from Ms. Ms. Jones. I don't anything, know. What anything, I anything else or are you ready to move on to Mr. Brown? I, I mean, like she still has the floor, so she's. Uh, hold, no, go, hold Ms. Sue, you still got time. Go ahead. Yeah. Just just one more thing. You know, I've, I've, I just want to be sure that. Um, if, if this if we move forward with this proposal that we give leaders in our buildings the opportunity to lead because they're frustrated um what's good for Moore is not good for atkinson what's good for atkinson is not good for rehoboth what's not good for rehoboth may not be good for for carver you know we've got to allow these people that we've hired in these leadership positions to lead and uh this is not a top-down thing this is just Give them the dates they're going to start. Give them the dates they're going to report. And let our principals do the rest. I, I said in my email to my governance team, I feel like each school ought to have their own task force at this point to put this together. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Brown. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And, you know, one of my mentors, State Senator Lester Jackson, I've always heard him say that politics is just like football or basketball. It is a full on contact sport. And through this, we have heard from these scholars, we've heard from parents, we've heard from teachers. And um, I fully support my colleague of the fifth um, and anyone who is objectively looking at the data that is being provided by scientists and experts in these matters can see that it's simply not safe. We require teachers to be data-driven in their instruction. And as such, we must be data-driven in our decision-making. Our cases continue to rise since our last meeting. Cases have increased by 33% in Spalding County alone and almost 51% statewide. No one can guarantee that cases will not continue to increase as a result of our buildings reopening. Not one scholar, not one faculty member, and not one staff member at our schools to carry the weight of concern over whether or not today will be the day that they contract this deadly disease. If we have to open our school buildings with an exhaustive list of provisions in place, we are not safe. I have heard from many of my constituents within the first district, as well as others outside of my district, and I would 
and I would not be a responsible elected official if I did not take into consideration their concerns and make a decision that I felt served them and it was in the best interest of our district and a community as a whole. I have asked many critical questions in order to gain assurance of the fact that our schools are and will be safe moving into this new school year. Some of the answers that I have received have not given me the confidence I need to vote yes on this. I am always going to advocate for the health and safety of every single student, every single person that is impacted by the Griffin Spalding County Schools every day. As it relates to the frequently asked questions, one thing I'm not in favor of is having teachers to do deep, deep cleaning. You know, the young people, when they put the two words together, deep, deep, or for real, for real, you know that it's a problem. However, we must make sure that time is allotted for rooms to be cleaned, that this is still unclear, which is another reason we cannot ensure the safety of every scholar and numbers are steadily increasing. However, colleagues, this moment gives us an opportunity to be innovative and rely on our communities to collectively in order to meet the needs of our constituents. We may never return to normalcy as we once knew it. Let us do the work to figure out how we can continue to provide a rigorous and quality education for our scholars virtually. Every student in our district still deserves an equitable education. This means we need to exhaust every avenue possible to ensure that resources are met each and every day to meet the needs of our students with a particular focus on the needs of our students with exceptionalities, such as students that have ADHD, students that have autism, and of course, our black and brown students and all students. Creating equity in our instructional practice, practices virtually can not only meet our short-term needs, but it can also benefit us in the long-term as we discover that some of the virtual strategies can be implemented even when entering back into the buildings. We have a grand opportunity, folks, to improve our instruction overall and when we are inclusive of all resources that are available. Mr. Chair, if there's any time left, I yield the balance of my time. Thank you for listening. All right, Ms. Barbara Joe. Mr. Chair, I want to thank the task force. They've done an admirable job. I just have highest admiration for everything that they have done. I've been on this board a long time and I've never had as many comments, concerns, input from constituents. This is one of the hardest decisions that this school board has ever had to make. The comments and input that I have gotten have been almost equally split 50-50 with going remote learning and going face-to-face -face learning. Option one was chosen for our school system. I firmly believe that parents need to be able to make a choice between remote learning or face-to-face -face learning. So I'm for staying the course of option one with the start date of September 8th. Okay, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I've uh, have been intently listening, purposefully. I've read every email. I've looked at various educational sites kept up with the Georgia DOE as they even made revisions as late as the 13th of July. And this is not for me personally, and that's what I've been telling people that have been asking me this question. It's not about me personally because my wife and I don't have any kids school age kids that are attending anyone's school. So my 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 decision is a pro professional one and it's based on all concern. That means not only just the students, uh the staff, all staff, not just teachers, but all staff 
custodians, nutritional staff, bus driver, all included. And 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 I'm at the I'm at I'm at the point where I feel like we should start totally virtually, but we should not put a concrete time on how long we will go virtually. We need to leave that open ended because we need to reassess conditions at first thought during Thanksgiving break during the Christmas break and doing the change over at the first of the year. We, we shouldn't just say we're going to do it for nine weeks. We, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, so we need to leave that open ended. And I feel like we need to go back to the original start date because I've listened to what the superintendent has said, how pushing it back will affect us even what miss jones brought into play and what dr sauce brought into play about uh the funding uh piece of it so i think we need to go back and 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 i've heard from some staff people about child care for them personally also during that time we have some work to do and we need to continue working on our plan to return to the building while we're going through the virtual process, meaning we need to rethink about our cleaning, our social distancing, the whole nine yard, because just being realistic, we have problem with the cleaning right now without the pandemic. We have, we have people complaining about things not getting clean, bathrooms not getting clean, not having soap and uh, water problems in the bathroom. May not be all school, but I know one school particularly that is going through that. We we have to we have to be realistic. We can put all this on paper and say this is what we're going to do, but the reality of it will it get done? Will it get done? We have a problem now. Let's be real. We have a problem now with custodians cleaning the school properly. We have a problem now with things being taken care of in our school. Something simple as having soap in the bathrooms. And now we're being given the task of doing deep cleaning so that people won't be, listen, uh, infection control is serious. And then we have to let teachers, what I did, these are what I've, I've written down. We need to let teachers teach from their environment, let them teach from their classroom virtually where they have their needed resources. They have their whiteboards or whatever, and they, and they can do a better job of teaching from their classroom. We need to monitor the staff that will be coming into the building each day. I've, I've sent information to Mr. Smith and the board about getting staff and students tested. I've, I got a, got, I got a reply from Mr. Smith about the contact information for the lady that is proposing to do it here in our community. What have we done about that? I haven't heard anything. What have we done? about testing students and staff before they do anything. And then I saw the report about testing students. We'll depend on them to get that temperature taken at home. And then we'll test them once they get into the building. That's after they've gotten on the bus, not social distance on the bus, then gotten off the bus and we're gonna test them once they reach the school level. That's unacceptable. That, that, that is unacceptable. And then I, I have down noted, uh, and, and I thank Miss Sue for mentioning it, but I had it written down. We need to let these principals manage their schools. We can give them some guidelines, but they need to be able to manage their school because 
a one size fit all model will not work for everyone. We do not need to give them a one size model for everybody to comply with. We need to give them some guidelines and let them do what we pay them to do, which is to manage their sites. We, we, we micromanage these principles too much and it has to stop. We need to let those principles gauge the, 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 the guidelines that we give them to their, to their schools. I heard someone say, I think it was Miss Sue, Atkinson is not the same as Ann Street. No, they're not. Not the same as Crescent. Not the same as any other school. They're not the same. They're totally different. So we need to let the principal have the leeway to use their staff, know what they, they, they their strengths are, and have them to do it and cater to their schools. We need to stop trying to micromanage them. It, 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 it's gone too far and been going on too long. And the last thing I, I want to speak about is that we have experience doing the virtual learning. We started it at the end of last school year. We have experience. We, we kind of know what to expect. We know what we need to improve on. We know what we need to do. But going back into the building, with this pandemic going on, we have no clue. We have no experience. So, so for me and what my vote is going to be, I hope we can change the date back, let the teachers go ahead and start. We, we can eliminate all the corruption that mo moving a date back will cause the system. Go with the original start date. Let these babies be safe. I, I, I've heard Miss Sue say, hey, I can't keep you safe. I can't guarantee your safety in school, but I can I can guarantee you that I keep you away from some of the stuff if you are at home. The rest is up to you. But I, I am not in favor of, of sending staff and students back into these buildings until we have a better hold on what we are dealing with and how we're going to deal with it because all this stuff that everybody is putting on paper everything that cdc is recommending they've never done it they don't know they're just speculating and and, and we have more experience dealing with virtual a virtual learning uh, uh uh model than we do sending people back into the school with this pandemic so i i i, I would gamble on what i've already experienced and what I've already dealt with. So so that that that's my my spiel and I apologize that I wasn't able to be on with you all when when the discussion first came up uh but that was a technical difficulty cuz I was I was ready and able and was trying and and uh could not log in. But but that that's what I have come to a conclusion with I I think we should start virtually see what this thing is going to do through our thanksgiving break through our christmas break reassess it reassess it after the first of the year and 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 let's keep these kids and these babies safe look i have i have kids that are going to have to deal with working and and virtual learning just like everybody else do i understand that i i have grandkids who 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 have to be around other kids to socialize guess what i take it upon myself to to go and get them and take them out take them to the park do things with them you just gonna have to step it up pull up your big boy and big girl panties and get it done we 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 can't we can't make everybody happy and i'm not trying to make everybody happy i'm trying to do what's best for all concerned and i think a virtual learning is the best thing that we can do for these babies and our staff member. Let our staff member know that we care about them too, because that's the biggest thing I've heard. We don't care about them. We, we They are expendable. They're not expendable. They're just as valuable as the students. So that, that's my spiel. I thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to, to uh, express 
uh, what I've what I've uh, written down and and what I've come to a conclusion on over the last couple of weeks. But I, I, I think we should start virtually and we need to move back to the original start date. OK, thank you for sharing. Um, I will take a few minutes and um, and share um, based upon what's been said. Doesn't know that it would uh, make a lot of difference at this point in time, but um, I feel it's important to uh, to reiterate my, my thoughts and my feelings. Um, obviously, we do not know what to expect and what, can, what is going to happen. Uh, we all have read articles. We all listen to the news. We all listen to the different things. Um, but when it comes down to it, we have to put uh, our trust and our hope into um, people that have been studying this and doing that. Uh, I have been looking, like you have, to what the CDC has to say, to um, what the Georgia Department of Education has to say, uh, what public health has to say, what the American Academy of Pediatrics had to say, what our local doctors, pediatricians had to say. Um, there are as much uh, damage that is happening socially and emotionally uh, with students that are being uh, separated. Um, and that's not good. We have the opportunity um, to give both options. We have put it before our parents and they at that time have said this is what i want um i want this option to be able to have that choice uh there is absolutely no one on this call that can make decisions for a particular student better than their parents uh, when we take the opportunity to because of fear because of not feeling as though uh somebody's going to do what they say they're going to do uh, our system has already shown us that the plan that they have in place, uh, following all of the guidelines, making things happen, and we are handcuffing our parents and causing them to put their children possibly in harm's way because of our choices and decisions in that. Uh, and that's wrong. Um, we have the option, based upon all of the information that is being given to us, to be able to give them a choice. And denying them that opportunity is wrong. Um, you know, I'm assuming that when I'm done speaking, there's going to, somebody is going to want to make a motion um, and there'll probably be a second, maybe a little bit more discussion on it and then a vote will be taken. But everyone has to be able to look at your constituents. Everybody has to be able to look at parents and say, I made my decision based on this and I didn't care what the other people said. We have extreme from left to right. We have, uh, Obviously, I'm, I was thrilled when I heard we have 43% that are choosing virtual. That makes it all the much easier to be able to accommodate those that are sitting in a classroom to be social distancing. Those that had issues with masks and children having to wear masks, we're going to be limited on that because with the wide open classrooms that we would then have, we would have the opportunity for them to be able to take those masks off. Sure, there may be times I have to have them on, but we're doing, I believe, our community an injustice by not giving them the opportunity to make the decision themselves. Mr. Chair, can I can I just uh, say one thing about about that choice? Sure. I, I sent questions. I sent questions from a staff member and from parents. And I and I I sent it to the superintendent and every last one of the board members. There were some parents trying to make a decision. I think I and I know I sent it to you. They had to make a decision by this Friday of what they wanted to do. There was questions that had not been answered. And 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 and, and I'm not gonna say how many. I I don't know, but there was questions that were not answered because i i sent in a concern of a parent and i stated this parent need to know this before friday before they they have had to make a decision but not one person from central office mr smith included gave me an answer so i couldn't give this parent 
And this parent was asking not only for her grandchildren, not her grandchildren, but her, her nieces and nephew, her brother's children, and as well as some other people. She's a teacher in our system. So they were looking for answers from her, and she couldn't tell them, so she asked me. But I guarantee you there were other people waiting on answers before they decided what they were going to do. But there were some people who were confident, 43%, that they were going to send their, not going to send their child to a brick and mortar building. But see, some of some some of the questions that people had never got an answer, still haven't been answered. So that's why that's why I say there's a lot of uncertainty that we have not answered. We have more questions than answers. And, well, and, and I, I would like to... information we have gotten from the pediatrics and everything, they are not scientifically uh uh are proven because we don't even know what we're dealing with with this with this virus we're shooting in the dark hoping that we'll hit something from the cdc on down to the pediatric and 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 i and i have i have talked to and i know people personally that work in these organizations and they don't know they're shooting in the dark they're giving their best best answer and most people give you that answer based on them personally uh from whoever is influencing them but I, i'm not letting anyone influence me i i've listened and i've made my best educated guess and opinion on what will be best for all concerned that is we don't know what we're dealing with we don't know what it's going to do how it's going to affect us but the best way to eliminate some of those threats is to keep the people from those things. I dealt in emergency medicine for 29 years. I, I do have some experience dealing with issues like this infection control, SARS and things that have, have hit us. I have experience. And the best way to eliminate that threat is to get away from it. So, so everybody got their opinion, but I base mine on what I have experienced and what I've gone through. And, and if you're a Bible reader, you'll know that gives you some wisdom when you had experience. So I, I leave it at that. So don't 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 don't, don't think that these, these these surveys that we've done is an end our answer because you look at the number of who responded to them. We 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 got over 10,000 uh uh 400 students i guarantee you we didn't have we didn't have parents for uh all of those kids to answer those survey we didn't have parents that wanted to maybe go do virtual they didn't have answers so they didn't know what to do. so so let's not play games about these numbers on these surveys because they are skewed they they, they we didn't get a hundred percent participation we didn't have any type of level uh, that we were looking at that was going to be a, a, a level of participation that we felt comfortable with. We never set that, never heard that. When you do a survey, you set those parameters. So, so let's not play games about these numbers when, 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 when not everyone participated in doing the survey. That just gives you an inkling of who participated in the survey, how they thought, and what they thought. That's not a, that's not an overall a picture of what everybody that is in our school system thinks and wants to happen. So that 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 survey, it, 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 I looked at the number of the respondents, and and it, and, and it really just went out the window for me because it wasn't a true, true picture of what parents and students are represented in our system. Only the ones who chose to 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 do the survey. Their voice got heard, but not everyone's voice got heard. And I, I would say and, and Mr. Saying, Chair. And understand if again I'm gonna just reply to what he said and then I'll give you an opportunity, Mr. Brown. Yes, sir. Um in in reply, we needed the information to be able to know what was going on. The reason that we had to end that without them having all of that information and all of those answers is because if we only had 5% come back and said they wanted to do virtual, 
then the method that we were going to be choosing wasn't going to work. And so in order to do option one, we had to get an idea of how many we were looking at. And so when we, you know, when several days ago, we knew that we were around the 25% mark and it ended up shooting up to that 43% mark. We have done our central office in injustice two weeks ago. We threw a bombshell on them and changed the date from a recommendation that they were wanting. Mr. Chair, parliamentary from- inquiry. I, I have to stop you. I have to stop you because if you're going by norms and protocols, it seems like the majority has this. And to you, for you to say that that's an injustice, you're out of line for that, sir. We haven't taken a vote. I'm just sharing my opinion, Mr. Holmes shared back to me with something that I said, and I was just taking the opportunity to do that. I told you I would give you, you an opportunity in just a minute. And, and let me ask this question, Mr. Doss, or anyone. What what was the what 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 was the 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 the, the, the error number that you all placed on this survey? Plus or minus? Let me ask let me ask that question. I, I've done plenty of surveys, brother. <laughs> What what, what 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 was the margin of error plus or minus that you placed that was placed on this survey? There, there was not a plus or minus because this was a preference survey, not trying to be a pre- Mr. Smith. This I, I, I know you something, man, and you know, you know when you're doing things like this, you have a margin of error that you that you mm-hmm. have in there that you build in there. For your for for a survey, and I'm just asking the question: Did you did did that get into the equation? No, it did not. Because okay, not that's, a, that's all. That's all I want to know. No, because this is not a normally, normally it, it, it's, it's there. Yeah, it's just no, like if if, if you work in a organization, and and a lot of people don't understand, you go to a retailer and they have so much of theft. Guess what? If it doesn't exceed the margin of error that they have, they built into their budget. They don't worry about it. Just, they're just like people be complaining <clears> about people being on, on food stamp and, and so and social security. If it doesn't rise above that number, guess what? They're not going to expend any energy and time investigating who who's fraudulently invest, uh, getting social security, food stamp, or whatever, because it never breaks that margin of error. That's why you build in a margin of error when you're doing surveys. Well, we had okay. well I had one of our parents. I had told Mr. Brown I would circle back around to him. Did you have something else that you needed to add? Uh, I yield. I was um, Mr. Doss. Yes. I was just going to ask Dr. Kennedy a question. Do we know how many families answered the survey? Because I know when I watched the Henry County. Um, their latest board meeting, they had like 38 out of 43,000 families that answered. Do we have any of that information by chance? Uh, yes, that was a part of the presentation that I can pull that information for I'm you a, right now. I must have missed it. But while you're looking for that, I do want to, I, I do, with regard to what Mr. Holmes just said, with regard to um, the date that the survey was complete, it, it it kind of, I think it kind of backfired because I had so many inquir- inquiries myself. Can can they move the date up until after this board meeting so they could decide? So, but I, but, and on the other end of the spectrum, I understand why you needed that information, but I think most of our parents would have wished to, to make that choice after this meeting tonight. So, but I, I understand the other. We had- I was going to propose that we open reopen the window if somebody needed to opt in but that's that's a new point i'm sorry dr kennedy for interrupting oh that's okay we had 3086 families to respond to the survey and we at that time we served 5367 families um so we had 57 percent participation of families that responded all right thank you somehow i missed that i'm sorry you're welcome all right um i just can i can i say just a few more things mr doss all right you know with regard to i don't know if any of the cabinet members saw what i had proposed last week but you know we're and and this is fluid obviously 
uh, just proposed four day work weeks. Friday's off at schools could be deep cleaned or we could do four day work weeks where we teach Monday, Tuesday, deep clean Wednesday, teach Thursday, Friday, deep clean over the weekend. There's all kinds of ways. Um, RCD would kind of lay low at the beginning of, of this particular school year. Uh, we need to be sure that all of our students have devices, teachers provided devices, face-to-face uh, -face instruction, record lessons so they can be watched again or at student parent discretion convenience. Um, as Mr. Holmes and I have said, let the administration work, put together what's best for their schools. Um, I believe it's uh, incumbent upon us to help our teachers out with regard to bringing their kids to school during pre-planning. Um, they can stay in the teacher room, no roaming, stay on the campus. Um, you know, we just got to help our people out because these are unprecedented times. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways we can we can we can work this. Um, I do believe the one size for all doesn't work, isn't working. Um, and again, I just feel like each school should all have their own task force and let the leaders lead. So there's all kinds of ways we can we can make this work. Well, is there going to be a motion that is put on the table? I know that we have, you know, we changed the last meeting, we changed the direction for our staff, and it looks as though this meeting we're going to be changing the direction for our staff. And so we need to be able to give them something that they can work with. Well, I think I think they said they said, Mrs. Dawes, if you if you heard from like uh some of us have, they want to go back, they want to start when when it was originally plan to start and i think miss sue gave an explanation of why we pushed pushed it back to try to get prepared but 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 staff members saying that they want they want to go ahead and start and that new teachers get trained and i make a proposal that we start virtually uh and 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 we go back to a, the original start date and we leave leave it open as to how long we'll go virtually so that we can assess what the conditions are, what the situation are, and we can make a decision based on what what is presented to us at that time. What's the, what's what's the original start date, Dr. Kennedy? Well, and I was going to ask if I could uh, speak to that, uh, Mr. Holmes. The original start date from the task force, if we were offering option one uh, from that discussion, was August twelfth. If we're going all virtual. I would not propose August 12th because we would have to get Chromebooks out to all students and any other materials. We would have to bring in students at staggered times to be able to manage social distancing. And that's gonna take a number of days. It will be like what we did at the end of the year when we collected those materials over, it was over quite a period of time. So I would not recommend us using August 12th. August 12th was based on option one. Sure. Well, well, let me ask you this, Dr. Kennedy. When we first went virtually, I'm going back to what we've done. I'm going back well, to we, what, we, what we did when, when we was in emergency mode trying to get it up and started. How long did it take us to get, get, get Chromebooks out to students? Well, remember on the day when we went virtually, we had students in school on the last day and they were issued their Chromebook before they walked out the door. So mm -hmm. any student that was in on campus receive their Chromebook. If the student was absent, we had days that those students came in and picked up Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. We're doing it to a totally different situation because now no student has their Chromebook. We're gonna have to bring them in to receive those materials. They received them when before they left um, in March. So okay, that's a I, really different I, scenario. Okay, I understand that. But what I'm asking you is what, what was the time time frame on on doing each one when we when we first gave them out they were in school but when we picked them up they were not in school how long did it take for us to get to uh get the get the chromebooks from from them oh you're saying from collecting i thought you were saying it from right. the beginning excuse me uh mr holmes i misunderstood uh this principal scheduled over a series of days during a week so that's why i'm saying that we would need to move that back at least to uh the 17th um to be able to use that entire <clears throat> week to be able to for principals in schools to be able to uh schedule times that students can rotate in to pick up and work with families to be able to do that um 
So that's why I would push it at least back to August 17th would be my recommendation. Well, yeah. well, I go with your recommendation because I know you've considered what we've talked about today about the scheduling, about, about, you know, having so many days, getting so many days in and get having the time to do the work. So if you feel comfortable with August 17th, I'll, I'll, I'll amend my, my, my motion to, to August the 17th. Okay. And I can tell you, Mr. Holmes, that the the, the people I have talked to in, in leadership positions said they could they could be ready by August 17th. Okay. But Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman just, a, just a point of order, if I could. We have a motion and well, we we may not. Okay. We just okay. Hear, hear me out real quick. Uh we our 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 rules require us to generally follow Robert's rules. If we generally follow Robert's rules, this motion is to rescind a motion previously adopted at the last meeting. If Mr. Holmes, no offense, but Correct. you were not able to attend the last meeting. So if there's going to be a motion, it needs to be by someone who voted on the winning side at, uh, at the last meeting. And the only reason I'm getting this technical this is a very controversial subject. I will try to, I want to avoid any controversies over what the board's about to do. And that's that's the only reason I'm speaking of. And, and, and I take no offense, Mr. Shepard, it's your, it's, your, it's your job to keep us straight. I, I buy you a Coca-Cola for that tomorrow. So, Ms. Sue, can you make the motion? And I'll second. I'll make, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, is it okay if I make a motion? Yes. Uh, I make a motion that the board rescinds the September 8th start date. And and I second. Okay. And that's all there is to the motion? They still want and Mr. so the new plan Mr. should the new plan should, re should reflect on the team. Well, I was just waiting until we did that before I made the second one. Or well, just put it all put it all into one motion. Well, I thought Mr. Holmes had the motion on the floor. He, he's not able to because he wasn't <laughs> present at our meeting. I, okay. I, received, I received my my attempt at a motion. <laughs> okay. So, so Ms. Sue, you'll make the motion according to what he said with the start date being the 17th, and then I will second that motion. Mr. Chair, I, re I rescind the September 8th start date with a new proposal of 100% virtual start in Griffin Spalding County School System with an August 17 start date. Okay, I have a motion. I proudly second. And I have a second. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, can I have one other point or question based on uh, what Ms. Ergel talked about, what Dr. Ergel talked about earlier? Is is the motion to accept GRCCA and mainstay from the virtual only option, or is the motion to include GRCCA and mainstay? Motion is not to include them based on our previous discussion with Ms. Jones. Okay, that's my understanding. I just wanted to yeah. make sure the motion's clear. Sure. Very clear. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Chair, can I make a comment? Yes, sir. We are we, obviously we are going to follow the board votes to do. Um, I appreciate you as we considered this to move that on seventeen day because we do need some time to to make this work. We have we spent the last ten days working on a great start date, even though we all did see what Ms. McDonald sent out. Since that was not the approved plan at the time, we were not working on that plan at the time. Sure. It will take us some time to go back and work this through. We do certainly want to let our principals manage their buildings, and I believe we do that. They have a lot of leeway on how they use their resources and manage their programs. However, there is going to, need to be some consistency to some degree to make this work. I think we're seeing the problem with this now as all cities, counties, schools, states 
are doing their own thing, even in even in responding to the COVID. So I think we need to have some level of consistency to make this work as a school district. So please let us look and work with our principals uh, to make that work for everyone. We do what we do want that to we do want that to happen. Um, I do want to again thank our staff for the work they have done uh, over these last um, gosh several several weeks in putting a plan together. They have spent countless hours doing this. And I don't want anyone out there to think they have taken this lightly because they haven't. Mm -mm. I disregard anyone's safety, that we have looked at guidance ad nauseum as it changes virtually daily. And we have we have stayed up with what the part of public health is, 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 uh, has, has suggested. I even had a conversation this afternoon with them about that to see if anything had changed and understand what they were what they were saying. And I do believe that our staff took those guidance pieces and they came out and tried to adjust our plans. Of course, I appreciate very much what Dr. Kennedy, her task force did, all that were on, all of our cabinet did. And I, I, and I do respect the, uh, the concerns that people have. I know they're out there. They see them on the news every night. But in some regard, we also try to take some of the emotion out of this and make a decision based on the facts and on the best guidance we could get from the medical community. And I know even all of that hasn't always been um, agreed upon even across the nation, but that's all we've got. That's the best we've got. And, um, and so um, while we will, of course, um, uh, defer to the board's judgment on this and we'll do what, um, what, you, what you end up voting to do, I do think the plan we put together did meet the guidelines and would have been a workable plan uh, based on the work that was done by our staff. And I appreciate very much what they did. Okay, board member. Since, since Mr. Smith had, had that comment, Mr. 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 Chair, uh, I, I, cannot, I cannot sit here and, and, and not not ask for a point of privilege to uh, to address what he said, if that's okay. We're we're in the discussion right. area. Okay. Well, well, Mr. Smith, uh, you know what you just stated, just like I've stated and everybody stated, is your opinion. That that's your opinion, and you're entitled mm -hmm. to it. But I'm telling you what. And I keep telling you all, I guess you all don't hear me or don't believe me, but I talk to a lot of people, including principals. I don't call no names because I do not want to put them under, under the microscope. But I talk to plenty of principals, and I've told you this before. They're frustrated. They're frustrated. And what you call giving them leeway to manage is, 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 is not true in their eyes and them doing their jobs. These, these people, these people, we put them in this position as principals and as leader of their shop. I call them the CEO of their of their of their stores. They're the CEO of their schools. They run the schools. You all at the central office just give them guidelines. Let them make it work. That's all I'm saying. You don't have to watch over their shoulder and meet with them every Tuesday, Thursday, whatever day it is, to see if they pulling their socks up right and, and, and they got the shoes on the right foot. Let them manage. And if you see something that needs to be tweaked and, and something that needs to be addressed, then you do it. But you don't you don't you don't have to get with these people every week to manage them, micromanage them on them taking care of their school. That's taking them away. From from the building, where, where most of them would rather be in the first place. I've heard that a hundred times. Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes so, can, so I, I, can I, 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 Mr. Dawes, I'm just uh, trying to guide you back towards the topic of our. Well, well, that, well, not, uh, that that was the topic. That was his comment. I, I said I wanted to address it, so I'm gonna address it. So so that's your opinion about you. You allow them to manage, and that's the problem. Perception are are, are not re re real with what is actually going on. So, so I appreciate the work that's been done, but it was ridiculous, Mr. Smith, for us to even have to ask, was there any parents on the committee? Was there any, any funds from the community on the committee? Were there any students on the committee? Oh, uh, and, and the answer we got, well, it was an oversight. You all are the professionals down there, man. That should not have been an oversight by nobody that's down at the central office that was on that doggone committee. If we're going to be inclusive, 
which which means the the community dictates to the board and the board dictates to the superintendent and on down the line we didn't have any representation from the community those are those are our customers we talk about customer service we need to identify who the customers are so 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 i i can't i can't sit here and accept that when 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 you all are the professional but it was an oversight that y'all didn't have the people that needed to be on that committee to make these decisions mr holmes we have heard your point do you have any additional information mr dollars i don't have nothing else let's do the vote okay we have a motion and a second all in favor signify by raising your hand to one we're seeing the original date right we're rescinding the original date we're doing 100 percent virtual on the 17th is what the motion is all right and that the other entities will be uh different which was the uh, college and career let's go so we had Centel and sue voted yes yes sir. those that are opposed raise your hand okay so barbara joe and will were opposed so the so vote is three two it is all right and so we are uh, <laughs> re-established the uh, school system having a more work to do and uh process to make it happen um we i think next on our agenda we have board member comments but i think all of us have had an opportunity to to give our comments is there anyone I'm that not, i have some other comments i would like to make mr chair before we go ahead and just get on out of here well we also have executive questions so that we'll be going into okay all right thank you but uh, i do want to say that as we look forward to uh making sure that our children i, I know that i mean as a georgia studies educator um and a georgia historian you know i would be remiss if i just sat here and not think about richard b russell richard b russell who served uh the state of georgia at the age of 23 as a member of the georgia house of representatives who then became governor at the age of 30. And through his time as governor, who uh, streamlined processes and made it to where uh, we would condense states, state agencies to, to be able to work together to better be able to serve the constituents of Georgia. And the state Senate. And one of his greatest contributions outside of bringing military base to Georgia, he and Carl Benson, was being known as the father of school lunch. And so I want to make sure that and to ensure that our scholars have, have meals. Um, I also want to make sure that we continue to have more task force that continue to listen to the concerns of teachers, to the concerns of parents. There will longer be no more over of us, including the uh, correct people in our that it can be. Um, and my last comment is, um, I know that we are going virtual, but I do want us to be able to think about ways that we can still have a day one in GSCS, as this is a, a program that, that I brought when I was first elected to the board. And so I want us to talk through, maybe at a work, work session, how a virtual schools. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other board member? Need comment? Okay. Hearing none, uh, I would entertain a motion. Then we go into executive session for the purpose of uh, teacher evaluation, teacher hiring, and Mr. Smith, help me with what uh, the other one was, or does that cover? I think you had some other other personnel item. Uh, that was uh, under the evaluation okay. of the teacher. All right. Okay. All right. Well, it, it was the um, it was the employment of person. Okay. So, so I'll entertain that motion. So moved, Mr. Chair. I have a motion and a second. Second. And a second. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, signify by raising your hand. So I want to thank all the general public that were on our call tonight uh being a part and listening um we uh, know that it's been a long evening um but thank you for being with us Mr. those that are I'd like, 
Mr. Yes. Chair, before I'd like to ask the board, I'd like to have Dr. Kennedy and Dr. Warren come to executive session with us for one of those issues. Okay. All right. Um, everyone, I think we probably have cut the live feed, I hope. And uh, anyone else that is uh, not needing to be in executive se se session is uh, able to be.